On behalf of the organizing committee, I would like to welcome you all to the first Human Cell Atlas Latin America Single Cell RNA-Seq Data Analysis uh, Workshop. Um, this is the second HCA event uh, targeting the Latin American region. The last one was in 2020 in September. And from that uh, meeting, we uh, came up with the idea of organizing this workshop uh, this year. So uh, uh, researchers that did not uh, know each other originally before that meeting got together. And thanks to the success of a virtual meeting like that one, we thought it would be feasible to organize a second one with a hands-on uh, moment too. So uh, the organizing committee is basically from Mexico, Chile, and Brazil. Um, it's a two-week workshop. As you guys know, I'm going to uh, just briefly introduce my colleagues from the organizing committee. So from Mexico, Enrique Hernandez Lemos, John Randall from uh, HCA CCI, Christine from HCA, uh, Tracy also from HCA, Vinicius from uh, Chile, and Wilson from Brazil. The scientific committee is here on the right, uh, added to our group Enrique Ventura also from HCA, Carlos from Brazil, Daniela Robres from Mexico, David Livingstone from Brazil, Inacio from Chile, Vinicius also from Chile, and Wilson uh, from Brazil. So the focus of this uh, um, meeting is to create more knowledge about the consortium uh, human cell atlas, but also and more specifically to uh, train people to be able to uh, look at this kind of uh, research with uh, a more um, uh, get near to this kind of research, right? Um, here, I would like also to introduce the second week trainers. So for the hands-on workshop from Brazil, we have Carlos, Juan and Rafael. They worked a lot with us to, to put together this program. Uh, from Chile, Raul, Eric, Thais, and Cesar. You're gonna be hearing Eric also this week. He has a talk too. And from Mexico, y'all be Guillermo, Ana Beatriz, and Laura. So these are the trainers that are gonna be joining people who are with us for the second week for this uh, hands-on uh, workshop. Uh, here, we would like to thank the uh, uh, institutions from the organizing committee that helped us and supported us in this uh, for this workshop and uh, the institutions that supported us to make this happen, right? And uh, finally, um, this for the webinar, we have support from Laura, Romario, Christopher, Ellen, and Elena. They have worked very hard to uh, help us put together a webinar for this um, for this meeting. A again, the Human Cell Atlas and specifically Luke, Tracy, Samantha, and Christine, and our supporters John Randall and John Nicole from the CZI. And uh, uh, with this, uh, we're going to start our program. Just here for you guys to have a, a look on what it looks like. So we have two first sessions. One is starting now at eleven and uh, a second one at, at midday and then we have a 45 minute break during the break you guys are supposed to leave the the meeting rooms and come back today at two for the next session then we have a break at four and those who are joining us for next week are gonna come back for project uh, design discussions uh, please be aware at the time uh, when uh, this meeting starts and ends because that varies a lot depending on when you guys are even though the meeting uh, was targeting most in Latin America, we have uh, quite a few people from all over the world. So from Europe, from Asia, uh, from the US. So please be aware of this uh, different time zones. It's very, that can be very confusing for every one of us. So with this, I'm going to uh, introduce our first speaker. Our first speaker is Dana, Dr. Dana Peer. It's a great honor to us to have, have her here uh, at this webinar with us. It's really a great privilege. So at Memorial Sloan Catherine Center, Cancer Center in New York City, Dr. Dana Peer is the Ellen and Sandra Gary Endowed Chair. She's Chair of Computational and Systems Biology Program 
director of the Ellen and Sandra Gary Center for Metastasis and Tumor Ecosystems, and director of Sloan Kettering Institute's Single Cell Research Initiative. The Dana Peer Lab combines single cell technologies, genomic data sets, and machine learning techniques to address fundamental questions concerning development, tumor heterogeneity, tumor plasticity, tumor immune interaction, and metastatic transition, together with regulatory network function and how this is derailed in the disease. To answer this and additional key questions in biomedicine, Dana has taken a leadership role in the Human Cell Atlas project to characterize all cells in the human body, how they organize into tissues and how these function in health and disease. So please, uh, Dana, thank you so much for joining us. Hi, uh, thank you for having me. Let me just share the slides and set that up. So, you know, I'm, I'm really excited to be here um, and, and, and welcome you all. And uh, I hope that as a result of this uh, workshop, uh, we could have uh, more uh, Latin American uh, participants uh, join us. Um, you know, we don't have enough in the Human Cell Atlas and, uh, you know, I, I really love all my uh, Latin American uh, colleagues and postdocs because they are so warm and speak their mind, which is very suitable for my um, Mediterranean uh, personality myself. So, you know, what is the mission of the Human Cell Atlas? I've come here uh, to, to, to represent the Human Cell Atlas as uh, both someone on, on the uh, organizing committee of the Atlas, as well as the co-chair of, of the analysis uh, working group. And again, the, 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 mo the biggest me message that I hope to give you is, is welcome. So, so what is the, our mission? It's really to, to build a comprehensive uh, reference map. If the Human Genome Project is a gene-centric uh, reference map, then you know, the fundamental unit of biology, the fundamental unit where, where, where biology happens is, 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 a, is a cell. There are some organisms that are just a single cell. And so we wanna understand all the cells in the human body and their properties and um, how they come together at the level of the tissue uh, and uh, what happens in, in disease, what, what they look like in health and what they look like in disease. Now, what is an atlas is, 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 is important to say, given a lot of the titles of a lot of papers, one would think that um, an atlas is uh, running a single cell RNA-seq experiment, uh, large or small, uh, and then creating a TSNI map or a U-map and then clustering it and annotating the clusters. I will say that just annotating the clusters and assigning them with cell types and biological function is, is not easy, uh, easy in itself, but this is, is not an atlas. What we mean in the human cell atlas is, is the full, full thing. Um, you know, with, with the advent of single cell technologies, sometimes we forgot that genes. Genes are in programs within cells doing important things. And in order to understand the, the cell, we have to understand the genes that act within the cell and what and how they're doing it. Uh, the atlas, you know, by definition, an atlas is, is a, you know, geographic term. Uh, we need to understand multi-resolution uh, positional information. We need to understand local cell neighborhoods and which cell types are together and uh, histology. And as we zoom out uh, to, to, to morphology and, and all the way down to, to, to entire organ uh, morphology. And so we really hope um, to, to get to a comprehensive atlas, a first draft, which we are nearing inter experimentally in terms of collecting in enough cells is, is one 100 million cells, uh, but the comprehensive atlas we assume will be about uh, 10 billion cells. That's that's a lot of cells, but really, uh, you know, data collection is, is 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 pretty routine now. And what's really the bottleneck and what's really the challenge is is computation. And all you computational biologists out there, we really need you. Uh, some some of the biggest questions is how can can we combine all this data in in a meaningful uh, manner so that we have an atlas that you can query. How can we actually build queries that take all this data and extract meaningful biology? And the challenge is both conceptual, what does it mean to query the atlas? But also there's huge challenges in computationally complexity as we go into millions, tens of millions and, and, and billions of cells. Now, the, the community is, is very active. And right now it functions at the level of each individual tissue uh, working together in a community. And so here you see 16 active biological networks 
uh, with the different uh, people that lead them. It's a very welcoming community. So if any of these tissues interest you, if you want to help analyze and, and work on any of these tissues, you can reach out to the coordinators of that tissue. And again, I encourage everyone to join and take an active part. I just want to give you, you know, some idea of, of what it means uh, to, as a community, because one of the reasons I personally love the HCA is we are a community and we love working together and, and we work together in, in a way that I haven't seen in any other biomedical field. And when COVID came along, even though we we're still trying to figure out the basic challenges of data analysis, we felt like this is a big thing and, and the community came together and uh, you know, put egos aside. This was driven by the postdocs. The postdocs wanted to work together in a completely open manner. And, and wanted to use what we have in all these tissues to understand COVID and where it's targeting. Very early on, we understood some of the uh, targets of, of the COVID virus, uh, the SARS virus, and uh, we knew it was the ACE2 uh, receptor as well as some proteases inside the cells. And we wanted to know in what organs and what cell types, where are these expressed? So we had the data to do that and we combined together. And here's three very quick publications that, that happened you know, within, uh, less than half a year of COVID. I mean, th this is when these um, were, were published, but as, as far as uh, open access uh, manuscripts uh, deposited, these were really put up very quickly, sometimes almost eight months before they were actually uh, published. And it really was a community effort of postdocs across multiple labs, across multiple continents. And so again, I'm really encouraging you to join. We, we want more members. We want more members from Latin America. It's very easy to join. The community is very welcoming. So now to, the, to, to our topic, the, the single cell data analysis. And, and what I hope is to give you sort of a little, um, you know, a, a little bit here and there to give you a feeling for the data analysis. What are the challenging, what you have to look out for and what's hard. So single cell specifically is, is very similar to RNA-seq except that through, through uh, microfluidics, we can add to each individual uh, transcript uh, during the RT uh, interaction, what cell this transcript came from. And we have an identifier for that transcript. So after amplification, we can sort of count this came from the same source, from the same molecule. So even though we amplified it and we, we see it uh, a thousand times, we know that this was the same uh, original man, uh, molecule from this cell. Um, even generating a count matrix from this data is, uh, is a challenge. Um, and so some basic data processing is, is still something that we need to resolve. Uh, and uh, once you sort of have a count matrix that you're happy with, you can begin to cluster this count matrix. You can begin to build uh, trajectories and understand cell space space. You can integrate uh, different data modalities, try and understand regulation, differences between disease and, and, and healthy, and even try and dig into some of these mechanisms. And all this requires computational algorithms. Now, as I said, even the most simple thing of going from your raw data, from your reads off the sequencer to a count matrix of these cells are real cells and they express these genes is, 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 is a non-trivial thing. And that's because of uh, sparsity and noise. Uh, this process, all this molecular biology that happens in all these tiny droplets, there's, there's a lot of uh, going on. Each cell is sort of amplified in its own little uh, microfluidic um, bubble in its own little uh, tube. And so you have different amplification rates, different capture efficiency, different uh, uh, disassociation uh, efficiency, and leading to different library size. So there's just a lot of artifacts that are going on. There's also ambient RNA in the background. And, you know, barcoding errors are common in, in, in single cell RNA-seq. Basically all these enzymes in a tube all together uh, with all these barcodes, they can get very creative. And, you know, even if you think, okay, but an error, we, we, we'll see it once. No, um, PCR amplifies not only true biology, but, but also the errors. If an, error happens early on during amplification, uh, PCR will be like a tornado that will amplify uh, these early errors that, 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 that do happen. This is not an, uh, this is an error prone process. You know, one of the challenges which we haven't yet solved so many years in is which barcodes are cell and which barcodes are ambient gut, dead, broken pieces of cells. Uh, here in a typical experiment, we put 5,000 cells uh, into the device and we get out 200,000 barcodes, which of these are cells and which of these aren't cells. 
maybe the cells that have lots and lots of transcripts captured, we can be pretty confident these are cells. Uh, but then you have ambient cells. Now, different cells have different uh, numbers of cells naturally. Uh, a fibroblast, I call it an RNA factory. It has a lot of uh, RNAs in it. A naive T cell, it has very few transcripts. It could get lost in what you'd think is ambient. And these are very, very unclear. Now, in the background, uh, yes, you have cells, one cell entering each droplet, one cell entering each uh, uh, isolated, separated tool. But there's a lot of dead cells, a lot of ambient RNA floating in the mi mixture. This is the ambient RNA that's creating all these false barcodes that make you think that it might be cells, but it's just like ambient RNA inside your, 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 your um, liquid. But if, if you think that the ambient RNA only uh, influences the ambient cells uh, and doesn't enter the real cells and doesn't uh, add noise to your real cells, you're, you're deluding yourself. Ambient RNA impacts all cells and you have to you know, keep that into, in mind when you're doing your data analysis. And, and this is particularly confounding for a lot of differential expression gene analysis where the ambient RNA between the samples are different and, and therefore that can really mess things up. So, you know, if I can give you one message is, you know, this data analysis is complicated and you have to do it with a lot of care and a lot of thought. Another thing that impacts the technology is that um, the single cell RNA-seq is sparse. People think of single cell RNA-seq as bulk RNA-seq except now you have a full experiment for, for each cell. That's not the case, what we're actually doing because uh, the reverse um, uh, transcriptase isn't particularly uh, effective is we typically capture only five transcripts in each cell. It won't help you if you um, sequence more because this is really a, an issue of, of capture. You can miss many of the key genes. I mean, this is like a, a, a um, bone marrow sample and, and the monocytes, you know, two and, and 6% of, of these monocytes express the key identifying markers for those mo monocytes. And uh, this is the sparsity of the data. And, and because of this sparsity, and because the sparsity has a completely different statistical structures, many of the methods that, that work and work well for bulk completely fail miserably for single cell uh, RNA-seq. So please do not use bulk methods on single cell RNA-seq. Single cell RNA-seq needs its own met, uh, methods both because of its own unique noise and because of this uh, sparsity right here. And so let me give you some idea and some intuition into the modeling framework that, that we use and the way we view single cell data. And, and I think understanding sort of the, it, it, the intuition, the rationale, how, you know, the, how these algorithms were built will, will help you understand them, um, their potential pitfalls, as, as well as, as how you can interpret them. So we actually take a, a geometric view of the single cell data analysis. And basically we, we, we treat each single cell as a vector in high dimensional space. Uh, here we have a space of, of, of three genes, uh, but of course this is a 20,000 dimensional space where basically a gene is a vector uh, represented by the levels of expression of each of its 20,000 genes uh, a sort of dot in, in 20,000 dimensional space, which is of course good that you have math and, and you don't have to think of 20,000 dimensional space yourself. Now, this is one single cell, but when you have many cells, you see that they begin to accumulate. You don't have cells randomly and uniformly everywhere in this uh, 20,000 dimension or even in this three dimensional space that I've drawn for you, but they accumulate in specific regions. There's biology that's driving these cells uh, to uh, particular states. And this really creates a, a, a geometry is what we call this uh, a cell, cellular manifold, uh, cellular phenotypic space. And our goal is to understand the space of possible cell states using a lot of uh, approaches that really treat this as, as, um, as the geometry. Um, and you know, this also gives us a lot of power. Now, we can't really, you know, here I drew, you, uh, drew a three-dimensional space and we can sort of handle three dimensions. We, we can't handle 20,000 dimensions and that's where um, dimensionality reduction comes. A picture is worth a thousand words. So one of the first things that we, we discovered is most dimensionality reduction had been uh, linear, PCA being you know, the most dominant method. Uh, here are some data, again, this is uh, blood. And you can see that these immune sets, each cell is a dot colored by, by uh, a hand-gated uh, immune subset. 
And you can see that PCA, you know, mixes all these immune subsets. You sort of get the T cells separated from everything else, but uh, a, a linear projection really doesn't get you the cell state specifically. That's where we came up with, with nonlinear uh, dimensionality reductions. That's where TSNE and later UMAP and all the other ones come. And, and what this trying does, it says, okay, let me try and project this high dimensional data, this 20,000 dimensional data into two dimensions in the way that best preserves this high dimensional geometry, in a way that best preserves these geometrical shapes that we have in, in these high dimensions. And you know, it doesn't have any axes. I know that a lot of people try and draw axes, calling it UMAP1 and UMAP2, but these axes don't mean nothing because there is no value to, uh, or, or meaning to the X or Y axis. Uh, the, the projection is really defined by the pairwise distances and cell to cell distances. And basically what this uh, projection is showing is that cells that are really nearby, that are next to each other in the projection are actually very similar, have very similar expression in high dimensional states. And cells that are very far away from each other, these blue cells and these red cells, they are far away and very dissimilar. At the medium range, there's a lot of trade-offs and you can't say much. And um, also it likes to put separated geometric objects, things that are sort of discontinuous, uh, specifically cell states, it likes to put them apart. And so what you see is that each, in this TSNE map, each of the main immune subsets are completely separately uh, mapped and projected. And, and you could see that these are the 2D projections uh, where they're clearly separated and, and, and their own little distinct hill. And that really is captured also in high dimensional space, which really captures all these dimensions and relationships together in the best way possible in 2D. Again, to try and help you show this geometry, I'm going to show you the same data, but now mapped with TSNE into 3G. And you can really begin to see that there is a geometry here. It twists and turns. It's concave. It's not, um, it's not these nice little Gaussian convex balls, but there is a true geometry uh, driven by, by these, um, you know, by biology, by feedback loops, by, by regulation. The data lies in what's called a manifold, something with geometric structure on a lower dimension that we can capture with this uh, dimensionality reduction. And um, the structure, the fact that biology is so beautifully structured, help us overcome all this noise that I just uh, told you about. UMAP is now more commonly used for immune cell subsets. Uh, sometimes force directed layouts are used for developmental relationships. But the important thing is never overinterpret any 2D projection. Whether it's TSNE UMAP or force directed layout, there is a lot of trade offs. You're losing a lot of information. Looking at things in 2D can be very misleading. I call it TSNE T reading. And some of the biggest mistakes and some of the worst things uh, published that have really led to incorrect biology has resulted from people trying to overinterpret something in two dimensions. A picture is worth a thousand words, so it's great for hypothesis generating, but always look and see uh, what's happening back in the high dimension. Now, one of the ways to deal with this data in, in high dimension, because it's very hard computationally, statistically, to deal with 20,000 dimensional space. So, so what we've come uh, to do in, 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 in this uh, world is to really map the data as, as, um, as a graph, a nearest neighbor graph where each cell uh, is a node in this graph and two cells are connected if they're very similar. So each cell is connected to their, its most similar cells, the cells that express uh, the most similar gene expression to it. And then, you know, all the computation we do, then it sort of defines a new geometry. And instead of looking at the distance between these two very, very distant uh, cells um, that, that cross a lot of space that's empty and void of any cell density, um, you sort of look at distances uh, between cells within the manifold. All the computation is along these edges in the manifold, which sort of keeps the data in cell density. You can sort of, sort of learn global structure in small steps. You can sort of think about it like a tight little mesh over the manifold. It has a lot of advantages because they have no dimension, but retain a lot of the high dimensional information. And that gives you a lot of power, uh, both statistically and, and computationally. 
One more term that I want to sort of show you what they are because they come across in a lot of papers and I want to make sure you understand where, where these terms come from. Again, PCA, principal component analysis, gives you the biggest directions of linear variation. And you can see the first principal component here captures uh, the biggest uh, axis of variation, but most of the first principal component is completely outside of the cell density. There's almost no cells that, that reside along this principal component. The, this principal component captures states that don't exist in biology. That's why we like using diffusion components, which finds the biggest axis of variation, but through the data density. So you can see the first principal component is drawn here. It's this big U that really follows the shape of the data and the data density. And then the second principal component would be really like you know orthogonal to this, so sort of the width of this little tube. And that's why we like working uh, with these diffusion components and why they're so powerful at capturing biology. And now, you know, once we have these neighbor graphs, um, we use them to really uh, represent the population structure. If you look for cliques, if you look for highly dense regions, if you look for areas of highly connected cells, that's what most of the community detection algorithms, what most of the clustering algorithms are doing are saying, in this graph, where do we have highly connected components where lots of cells have lots of edges between them? And that gives you the clusters or the cell populations. And now that you have the clusters, there are still edges between these clusters and these uh, edges between clusters represent cell state uh, transitions and, and trajectories. So the neighbor graph really is a powerful entity to, to, um, to capture this sort of uh, population structure. And many algorithms really take advantage of this neighbor graph, uh, you know, algorithms for visualization, data integration, differential gene expression analysis most recently. But for these to work, it's really critical. The devil is in the details. It really matters how these graphs are built. There are good ways to build these graphs and there are bad ways to build this graph. And because the data has so much noise, you have to be really careful about how you build the graph, how you clean up your data and what methods you're, you're using um, to make sure they're robust. One of the biggest challenges we have out there and some, again, another common place for mistake is how do we do data integration. It's really sexy to try and do data integration across modalities, for example, integrating RNA, single cell RNA-seq with single cell ATAC-seq or single cell RNA-seq with spatial transcriptomics. And you know, guilty as charged, I play in that domain as well. But what people don't really appreciate is it's also incredibly challenging to integrate data from a single modality, to even integrate a bunch of different single cell RNA-seq data sets, even collected in the same lab in, in a meaningful way. Um, batch effect is a challenge and even scale is a challenge. For example, only autoencoders can scale to data sets of millions of cells, but autoencoders, uh, they lose their ability uh, to query and, and look at specific genes. And um, you know, many of the computational methods fail on rare cells. And, and Rare cells, a lot of important biology is, is driven by rare cells, and I'll show you a few examples of that. So why is data integration so hard? And, and this is our slides I, I, I took from Alta Lukin, who's a really talented postdoc in Fabian Thais's lab. So you know, here's our first experience, experiment, our first uh, batch or sample. And, and you see clearly two distinct uh, cell types right here. Now you collect the second uh, uh, batch, the second sort of uh, batch, and here, you know, you have the same two cell types, but they map separately on, on the UMAP or the TSNI or whatever. There's a huge batch effect, so they, they don't align. And, 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 and what we'd want is for these to align. Now, what causes this batch? A lot of things cause this batch. The sample handling causes the batch uh, as much Baba, as possible. People, people think that, um, you know, if you just put them on the same lane, if you put them on the 10x together with some barcodes, then, then you're fine. Actually, you know, the 10x part is, is the minimum amount of batch. You could put them on different lanes and almost nothing will happen. It is the sample handling, how you take it out, how you disassociate, how you process, how you get these sticky cells to, to pull apart that's creating a large part of the batch. Some of the batch is ambient RNA that could somehow be fixed by, by barcoding. But, but really a huge part of the batch is the, the sample handling and, and no putting them on the same lane can help. And, and what we'd really like is to put this all together so that the, um, cell, the same cell type across multiple batches align. 
And just to show you just how hard this is, this is a uh, data uh, from Braga et al. from uh, Teichmann's lab. And, um, and you can see this is all from, from, from the same lab. This is the same publication. We're not even trying to integrate uh, across uh, different projects. And you could see here these uh, sky blue macrophages are all over the place. And, um, you know, they, they don't align together. Even all, all these are macrophages uh, because they do come from separate samples, even collected in the same project. And so you could try different bat correction me methods and, and, and many of them, even though you think, well, I applied a bat correction method, they, they, they fail. And you could see that, you know, some methods even seem to get wonkier. I mean, when you look at a plot where all these little stripes and banners and you have these long twirly thin lines, you know that something miserably fails. There's artifacts there, uh, many batch effects. This is right down here I'm, I'm showing you uh, with, with all the smush different cell types that put a, a bunch of cell types together that put the macrophages, the dendritic cells and the neutrophils all in one cluster. This is a uh, harmony that really tends to over smush and over um, integrate things. And, and this is the method that works best. But how do we know what method works best? Um, and so really evaluating data integration is important. And this is again, work by Malta in Fabian's lab. And there are many metrics. There are again, many trade-offs. There's no, um, one of the problems with data integration is there's no perfect method. Everything comes uh, at a cost. There's no free lunch. There's a lot of trade-off. So of course, one criteria is you want batch removal. You want samples that come from different batches to be well mixed up in, 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 in one another. And you know, if the batches are each create their own little region on the map, it's bad if they're mixed together. And again, on your neighbor graph, you have cells from many different batches, uh, that's good. But that's not the only thing, because then if, if we just wanted to put them all together, it just put all the batches to a single point. Uh, you want to preserve the biology. You want to preserve the cell types. Bad integration is something that takes uh, different cell types and puts them together. And good integration is when, you know, cell, same cell types are together, but separated from one another. There are a lot of, you know, cell types aren't the only thing that exists in the cluster. There's a lot of continuous phenotypes and a lot of the batch correction methods assume very strong clusters and miserably fail on, on all these continuous uh, trajectories that are, you know, very, um, that occur frequently in biology. Uh, they mess up the continuous structure of the data. And there's me methods that actually mess up the, 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 the gene level variation, the, the, the gene structure in the data. And so one of the things that, that Malta tried to do is say, okay, um, you can't have it all. There's trade-offs with the way you, um, you, you integrate. It really depends on what question you wanna ask. It depends on the data. It depends on the statistics of the data. It depends on the type of batch uh, that you have. Uh, no single method is best for all data sets. No single method is best for all types of questions. Uh, but let's try and take all these different metrics and qualify them. So when you have a data integration of all these different methods, you can sort of see how it's, it's doing. And here's a little example of, of what it helps when you, when you properly um, integrate data. Uh, these are all rare cell types. And when you don't have a lot of data, uh, rare, rare cell types really get messed up. When you integrate data properly and you have enough uh, representatives from each rare cell type, then you can finally get the, the, the rare cell types, these ionocytes and these neuroendocrine cells uh, and these tough cells annotated correctly. This is all in the lung. Now, of course, again, it really matters how you integrate the data. Surratt was a medium per performer. This was uh, with an autoencoder, again, but you lose the, the level, you, you get things embedded well, you get things labeled well, but you lose the expression of individual genes. The bottom performer, again, was, was harmony. Um, and again, rare cells is something I need to stress here. Batch uh, methods, usually batch correction, really assume that the samples should be similar. So they often overnormalize. They often overcorrect because they try and force the samples to be similar. If you're working with a developmental process, a time course, if you're working with a time course where things are supposed to change over time, this is an embryonic development uh, from uh, data. Um, this is uh, early um, mouse uh, embryogenesis uh, by Novoshin and, 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 and SETI. And you could see that typical batch corrections just like smushes all the time point together. 
And so we developed a harmony, a different harmony, not the harmony from Harvard, that really takes, um, that augments the data and says these data come from different time points, which really allows you to change the scale of similarity and, and, and not do this uh, smushness. Uh, cancer is another, I know you're gonna talk a lot about cancer. Cancer is another place uh, where, where um, it must be taken care because cancers are um, very different from one another. This is uh, data from Jerby et al, uh, from the Regev lab and each individual melanoma is completely different. It's in its own region of the, of the TSNI map. And that's fine because they are really very different. Cancers develop very differently. Each individual cancer is very different. You know, I see this, you know, this is an example in melanoma. I see it in liquid cancers such as AML and ALL and CML. I see this in solid cancers such as melanoma, lung cancer, colon cancer, pancreatic cancer. Um, so it's fine that your cancers are separate and, and often batch correction methods removes real biology, but immune, uh, the immune microenvironment of cancers, both across the cohort of melanoma and even like melanoma versus lung cancers versus pancreas cancer, the immune microenvironment is very, very similar. You might see different frequencies of the cells, but the cell phenotypes are, are similar. The T cells are similar, the N N NKs are, are similar. And so you really want the, the stromal cells to overlap. And here you see every dot on the right uh, is colored by the sample that it came from. And you see a complete beautiful mixing where each sample contributes to each phenotype on the map, this mixing that's really, really good. Whereas, you know, biologically speaking, the CD8 T cells are separated from the, uh, the, 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 the yellow CD8 are separated from the pink uh, CD4s are separated from the other immune cells. So when you're trying to vet your normalization and integration for a cancer data set, which you'll be working on next week, you really want to look at the stromal cells uh, and, and not overcorrect the, the, the malignant cells, which are truly biologically different. And so, you know, as I said, for data integration, there's no free lunch. You have to also, you know, each method also has different features. Some methods correct the count matrix, change the count matrix, which allows you to do downstream analysis from this corrected count matrix. Uh, some methods such as all the auto encoders give you a really nice joint embedding. It gives you great visualization. It allows you to cluster very, very accurately. It allows you to find similar cells very accurately but you're working now in latent space, you can't go back to the genes, you can't go back to the values of genes, uh, the, the matrix isn't corrected and going back to individual genes which drive a lot of the biology is, is impossible. And you can work with uh, aggregated unintegrated data and just use the batch as, as, as a variable in, in, in uh, an ANOVA scheme or something like that. Now again, to give you another example of, of, of COVID-19 and the community coming together in, in large collaborative groups, this was a, a Boston area effort to collect COVID autopsy data from, um, from patients so that you could look at um, these tissues in COVID uh, patients or COVID deceased uh, from autopsies and compare it to the healthy environment. And this really uh, was, was a huge effort. Uh, um, Again, a part of uh, the Human Cell Atlas's uh, uh, principles is to work across uh, a large diversity. And so we had many different ethnic groups here. And um, a lot of work was, was put into just building the atlas, just cleaning out the noise, just uh, normalizing the data, cleaning out the batches, uh, annotating the data, annotating cell types saying this is you know, our integrated data set. These are the cell types in our integrated uh, data sets. Uh, these are the differences uh, between healthy and immune. Uh, there were huge meetings around that that involved multiple PIs just to get that part right. And the moment you get that part right, you could do an incredible amount of uh, downstream analysis. And in this case, one of the, they found a lot of interesting things. One of the most interesting things that, that was found and one of the reasons that there's such failure in, in the lungs is these injured lungs, uh, there's a lot of failed paths to regenerate. No matter what path and what way they try and regenerate and, and, and fix um, the fibrosis, all these uh, regeneration pathways that normal healthy lungs have are, are all blocked and the lungs just aren't able to, to regenerate and, and heal in, in COVID. And so now for, for the final sort of 15 minutes or so of our, our talk, I'm gonna to talk to you about 
why I love single cell data analysis. My biggest passion is, which is like continuums and pseudo times and trajectories. And one of the most amazing features in my view of, of single cell data is that it's a synchronous. That is, if you take a single sample from your bone marrow, and this is one sample, it's not a time series, you have the entire developmental spectrum from early hematopoietic stem cells through all the different progenitors, all the way up to the early immature uh, erythrocytes, uh, monocytes, dendritic cells, and you get the entire continuum of all these cell states and everything in between. Let's see if that does. The um, slides that was set up um, to, to auto do stuff manually. Sorry, um, and you know this this signal of development is the strongest signal in the data. Even though I told you that this data is nonlinear and PCA is bad, this sig signal is so strong. Uh, we noticed it first in a Cytoff data set uh, in in 2011 where even PCA, this thing I told you doesn't really work that well, uh, really sort of did a half decent approximation of B cell development. The first principal component of the data matched development. But of course this was, was sort of messy and to get a good accurate deve uh, 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 developmental pseudo time, you had to work a little bit harder. And that's where this neighbor graph concept uh, comes where uh, you, know, you wanna really uh, uh, look, go along past in this neighbor graphs. As I told you, PCA sort of cuts across the space unaccurately. And, and these diffusion components, these steps and walks through the neighbor graphs where you go along edges within the data density, that allows you to get a pseudo time. Now, one more thing that needs to be done to get you know, really accurate um, high resolution things. So the distance between two step cells is the number of steps between them in this graph. So how many steps do I have to take along edges in the graph to get from you know, this cell, the first cell to the second cell. However, once you go longer and longer distances, you know, there's nothing perfect. The, the graph isn't perfect, the data is noisy. And, and as you go farther and farther away, uh, your accuracy um, isn't, isn't as high. This graph is, is, is an approximation, it's not perfect. And, and, and when you approximate, 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 approximate over long distances, uh, your, your accuracy deteriorates. And therefore an important part of, 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 of the Wonderlust algorithm, which was, was the first pseudo time algorithm was to, to really get what we call perspectives was to sort of look locally and try and say, um, you know, let's look a lot at a lot of short perspectives because short distances are more reliable. And just to show you how you know, the distances get messed up, this is just a simple two-dimensional arc. And we build a neighbor graph from it. And as you could see, the, the short distances, each line here is sort of like a, a distance. You can see that you know, progression is pretty accurate. But once we get far away, uh, this really, really advanced red state seems to be at the same time as this really, really early um, orange state. You really lose your accuracy. But if you go from the other direction, if you go from the red to the blue, uh, you get the red parts really accurate, but the blue parts completely lose their accuracy. So if you have a lot of different perspectives and, and weigh the, the, where you think the cell is along the pseudo time uh, relative to how short or long the path is, then you can get this perfect pseudo time that, that, that's really aligned and accurate at every single distance. And once you get something accurate, and again, there's about 120 pseudo time uh, methods out there. There are dozens that are good. There are even more that are bad because they're not that accurate. Uh, we could get you know, very, very high resolution pseudo time. We could get pseudo time that is so accurate that uh, we could pick up this really, really rare cell population where VDJ uh, recombination occurs. This is the pie chart. And you can see just how rare this population is right here. This is this tiny sliver right here of the uh, B cell progenitors and population three. That's where you have VDJ re recombination. That's where you have a unique signaling pathway that only happens in the seven and 10,000, oh, actually this is a three in 10,000 cells. And this is the population that goes awry in pediatric leukemia. So when we could recognize this really, really fine tight transitional population where we could recognize the signaling that happened in this population we could then see that this is the population that, that goes awry and, and is the source of pediatric leukemia. Again, rare population is the one that matters and many methods sort of 
skip over rare populations. So this was the first algorithm. I want to talk to you about some, some more uh, um, advanced algorithms to really map uh, development. And here the idea is, you know, pseudotime comes and says, let's take cells instead of putting them into clusters, let's put them on a continuum. Let's sort of define where they are from early to mature, uh, mature with a continuous number. And then, you know, there's a lot of methods that look for branching probabilities. Where does the branch happen? You know, here's a branch of the decision to become a monocyte or a erythroid. Where is the decision made? And, and there's a lot of these branching topologies. And one of the things that we realize it also cell fate choice. The branch point is not a point. It's, it's, it's pretty wide and the cell has probabilities. The cells retain a lot of plasticity. This is what we saw when, when we looked at the data and studied it. And so we wanted to model cell fate probabilities. Uh, a, a early progenitor, where is it going to go? Where, wh what is its likely terminal state? So again, we use this undirected graph, this neighbor graph that we've been talking about. We add pseudo time onto it because pseudo time is a pretty powerful thing. And we get a directed graph. And now we can use this directed graph to build something called the Markov chain, which really allows you to, to measure walks. And again, Details matter. How you build this graph matters. How you remember, I told you these waypoints are very, very important to sample the space. Uh, rare cell, uh, you know, if you just sample by average, you get all these population densities, but you don't get the rare cells. So here we put a lot of effort into really sampling in a way that got all these rare states. And the nice thing about a Markov chain, uh, taking a graph and turning it into a matrix is a Markov chain, there's a lot of closed form solutions which allow you to say, what is the probability from walking from cell A to cell B in a random walk? What is the probability that cell A will eventually reach terminal cell B first before anything else? And this can be you know, just computed mathematically in closed form. And so here, this is like the first graph where you, you translate the graph into a matrix where this is a cell by cell matrix where each, um, dot here in the matrix, each little red pink dot is the probability of moving cell from what cell A to cell B. Right now it's the weight on the graph because this is basically are these cells neighbors. But once we translate it to, to a mark of it to, to a matrix and all we have to do is matrix multiplication and gives you the probability of longer and longer paths. Now we have the probability of reaching from each cell to each terminal fate. And we can see how these probabilities change when cell fate choices are being made, um, when, where along the graph, in what order, in what timing. And it really captures the, the, the geometry of, of linear lineage diversification, but again, in a soft probabilistic manner. So, you know, we've applied this, you know, just to show you how, how it can really powerfully work. Uh, we applied this to study mouse uh, embryogenesis, really the earliest time points focused on the endoderm, this, this layer that will later build all your internal organs, your lung, your liver, your, your colon. And this was so accurate that even at these earliest time points as the cell is becoming embryonic and extra embryonic, because our pseudo time was so accurate, we could look at the changes in, in receptors and ligands and how they change over time. And specifically what happens when the cells are, are, are committing to a primitive uh, endoderm, to, to the extra embryonic tissues. And you could see this uh, commitment happens in a combinatorial, when, when FGFR1 and FGF2 are combinatorially high. And this was you know, validated with, with genetics uh, in, in the embryo. And you could also look at both the likely and unlikely path showing you this plasticity. So here entropy, plasticity, cells are really plastic. They don't know where they're going, this yellow plastic state. And then they choose to take an embryonic or extra embryonic state, whether they're, they're gonna be uh, primitive endoderm to the right or epiblast to the left. But you see that there's another region of high entropy, this other yellow region right here that occurs at, at the 5.5 embryonic day, where suddenly, you know, this is the unlikely course, but there is a trans differentiation and cells that had decided to become epiblast, that had decided to become embryonic, you know, suddenly change their mind and traverse and become extra embryonic. You know, that was our prediction. Our, you know, biological partners thought this was crazy, but we tested it statistics. We saw that this wasn't an artifact and indeed lineage tracing saw this, this remarkable plasticity where cells that had become 
epiblast, the cells that had decided to become epiblast, had the plasticity to change their morphological location, shape, and markers to, to, to extra embryonic, uh, but they were of epiblast origin, as, as, as indicated in the white, showing the power of these uh, methods. So really, these methods are, are, are really powerful. But these mark of chains, they're, they're actually a very flexible framework. And so, you know, we could use different features. We can add biologically meaningful genes. This method has been worked also with uh, single cell ataxic and epigenetic marks. It works beautiful. Uh, Prisca Liberali have used it with imaging features on organoids to sort of look at the progression of organoids rather than cells. That the, the, the math behind this is very powerful. And, uh, you know, we oriented things based on Pseudo time. But we can orient things based on a lot of other approaches, including RNA velocity, ataxic, uh, genetic mutations, you know, CRISPR lineage recording. And we're really exploring a lot of different ways to build this graph, uh, to build an, uh, the, the, the cell cell similarity metric, to, to orient the graph, uh, to, to build up the probabilities. And you know, just um, I'm going to go through this part really quickly. But you know, pseudo time assumes cells are going from the more mature. Uh, from the more immature to the more mature way. So immature to mature. This is broken in regeneration and cancer. So pseudo time approaches require a starting point and, and need to be taken with a grain of salt when looking at regeneration and cancer. So here, you know, together with Fabian Thais, we, we worked and, and said, okay, let's take velocity. Velocity looks at the differences, uh, at the dynamics between spliced and unspliced uh, transcripts that you collect, assuming that unspliced comes before the spliced to sort of say where a cell might go in the future. Now, again, one has to take these velocities in a grain of salt. And remember when I told you that you can't really trust what you see in two dimensions, when you see stuff smoothed on two dimensions, you see these beautiful, smooth, nice velocity plots and you say, ah, this looks beautiful. Well, let's zoom in at the individual uh, cell and you could see that these uh, velocities, you know, when you average them out, yeah, they look good. But when you look individually, they're pointing in completely opposite directions in, in neighboring cells. Some of them, like these tiny little arrows, are, are really in confidence. So yes, you know, it's saying the most likely direction is this direction. But, you know, I have almost no confidence in that. And, you know, velocity met, um, uh, vectors can point out of the manifold to, to regions where there are just no cell states and no cells ever existed. So here we really decided to combine the best of both worlds and using the sort of Markov chain method with the KNN graph and the phenotypic manifold palantir style and marry it with the directional information from velocity. And basically like letting these velocities propagate over the manifold using the same math I just showed you, but changing the way we, 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 we build the probabilities of going from one cell to another saying that cells should be going in the direction of the velocity. So if the, the neighboring cell is closer in its direction as measured by the angle to the direction where the velocity is pointing, there's a better chance we're going there. And once you propagate over uh, the entire Markov chain, you can handle uncertainty, you can compute long-term trends and you know lots of other math savvy tricks. And since you know I'm over time, I'm gonna sort of you know just tell you that this works really, really well. This was an example of, of pancreas development and regeneration. And you know, note that cell rank can be applied to really any vector field. And now we're applying it uh, you know, to lots of other vector fields, including a single cell ataxic. And again, you know, there's so many more challenges ahead of us. Computational biologists need to work hand in hand with uh, biological domain experts. If you're a biological domain expert and wanna analyze your own data, we're, we're not ready to give you easy to use tools. So you really partner up with the computational biologists. We have a lot of problems uh, to solve. I was a member of the AWG, we need more people. So I invite all of us, all of you to join and help solve all these open problems. And together uh, in collaboration, we can transform uh, biomedicine. And you know the HCA, because it's so collaborative and because everyone's so nice, it's just a lot of fun. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Dana. That was an amazing talk. I think you covered everything that we had asked and, and more. So it was really, really uh, great. We have a few questions for you. 
Okay. Uh, from mostly they are from the beginning of your talk, but let's see what comes up uh, here. So first from Tiago Lubiana Alves, he congratulates you. So great presentation, great challenges. And he's wondering what is your view on how granular the HCA will be? If there is an estimate of scale of how many cell types should be identified in the 10 billion cells manifold. So the, the goal is, is, is to be um, a, as uh, you know, granular as possible. As, as I showed, it's the rare cells that, that matter. It's you know, uh, one of the first publications uh, you know, by, by Aviv Regev that showed the value of this was really identifying these really rare ionocytes. And, and we, I showed you examples of how we really care that this integration get these rare cell types. We want to get these rare transitional sites, like the example I gave with B cells, where we saw this three in 10,000 transitional B cells, which have this really important and unique biology going on, VDG recombinations happening, the, you know, the, the, the DNA is shuffling, there's a unique signaling of uh, IL-7 to STAT-5. So we want to get this because actually disease happens when rare cells go, go awry. Cancer, for example, your topic uh, next week, so all these, you know, uh, rare um, progenitor cells, regenerating cells, uh, niche stem cells, that, that's what causes cancer. We need to be able to understand these rare cells, understand them in their niche. Remember, it's going to be spatial uh, in order to really use this atlas for disease. And, and that's the challenge. It's very easy to get average big populations. We can be done so easy. But it's actually the challenge is the rare cells, and we want to get them as rare as possible. And with 10 billion cells and really good careful combinations, I think we can get to an incredibly rare cells. Do you, think that from, yeah, do you think that from the beginning of the consortium now, how much has this changed in the view of people about how granular you can get or how you can really define those states? So of course, you know, there's always gonna be super, super rare cells that, that, that we won't uh, capture, nothing is perfect. I think from the beginning, we wanted to do something big and systematic and, 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 and pretty granular. Um, there have been some computations that people have had. I mean, program officers like to say, well, you know, with this power, with this number of cells, we have the statistical power to capture all cells of, you know, this proportion, uh, 0 0.5%, uh, you know, cells that are, um, you know, half a percent of the population, a fourth of a percent of the population. But even these statistics, I think, are wrong, again, because a lot of the rare cell types that we're missing is actually in, in some of the cell handling and cell disassociation. So I think that a lot of program officers like, you know, getting power analysis, uh, but I put power analysis aside and, and, and think that we really need to think about these rare populations because that's where biology is happening, that's where uh, disease is happening. And Great. I, think, that, I, yeah. think, I think the community agrees with that. Yeah. Um, we have a, that was a great answer, I think, for, uh, for people to interpret what, how granular this should be and, and the, the value of that, right? Yeah. Um, there is another question here uh, um, from Eric Santiago. He would like to know uh, when you're considering similarity between cells, if you consider mostly markers, so genes which are expressed, or also their level of expression. And how would the boundaries between different cell types be uh, defined then considering these two aspects? So these are really good questions. And, um, you know, defining a good cell similarity metric is a, in my personal uh, view, a very neglected question in, in the, in the field. And, and, you know, to get a cell similarity metric you know, you could build statistical similarity, but what similarity will best recapitulate important biology? Now, you know, the simple answer is uh, in, in, when constructing a similarity metric, we always look at the, the value. So it's not a binary on off thing, uh, but we actually do look at the actual value. People use different metrics and different distance metrics, but we do take the, the actual value rather than some discrete on and off. Now, the question is, what genes should we take into account? 
usually people consider only the highly variable genes because the genes that aren't highly variable can add a lot of noise to the data. So usually when people do this, they say, you know, what are the highly variable genes that are really varying significantly across my data set that are really defining the structure of the data? Let's focus on this so that we get, you know, less noise. Um, and then instead of 20,000 genes, people often do this on, depending on the structure of the data between 100, uh, 1,000 to 5,000 highly variable genes. Um, and, and those are taking at their continuous values. Now, if, if you know, for example, that some genes are really important in their biology and you really wanna make sure you include them, uh, you could just say, hey, you know, I know these markers are important. I just, you know, whether they fall statistically or not below some threshold, let's put all these biologically important genes into the equation. Uh, some people say, well, cell cycle is confounding what I wanna, you know, study. I, I, I want to remove it. So they actually actively remove cell cycle genes from their similarity metric, which is why, you know, how to build this, I was keep on saying, you know, how do you build this uh, similarity graph? A lot of it is, you know, what is your similarity metric? How do you make sure that it's statistically correct? How do you make sure that it's biologically meaningful? Really depends on your data on, on your question. And, you know, how many neighbors are you going to have? Some of the best um, graph constructions really uh, keep a, a fairly constant number of neighbors. So um, you sort of want to make sure that dense areas uh, really have much, much, much closer neighbors. Uh, and sparser regions still have a number of neighbors, even if they're far away. So usually in the graph, um, you know, you, you have different kernels to really build it. And, and that. A lot, uh, each method does something a little bit different depending on what it's trying to do and the biology and that's where all the that's where all the the, the meat is um how do you construct your graph what is your similarity metric what genes do you use uh what kernel do you use to define the distance between uh the cells and that's where where all the juice in the field is i hope this answered uh eric and I, I think it illustrates how probably uh, disease type dependent or biological network dependent is the choice of the models you're going to be using. And also the importance of the collaboration, very, very, very close collaboration between the biology, the biology experts and the computational biologists to be able to define which uh, best uh, model can be used, right? It is really, it is really important because um, the um, computational person doesn't understand what they're looking at. They, they just do statistics and, and statistics is, is not necessarily, there's so many trade-offs here that you need the biologist to guide what, what matters, what's the right trade-off. How do you fine tune this? And, you know, biologists can, you know, like for example, Surat makes it really easy to run analysis but there are so many pitfalls that are so easy to fall in. And if you don't understand some of these pitfalls, you know, Surat has no guardrails. So you can really, really reach the wrong conclusions. And that's why I, and it, it, it's collaboration. It leads to better biology and it's more fun and you learn from each other. That's a great conclusion for this question. Um, there's another question here, um, a little bit related to that, because that's Juan Manuel uh, Paturlani. He's asking if it's possible to already identify progenitor cell types in the uh, TSNE UMAP plot, like a cluster that would bridge different clusters. And again, um, in a lot of, in, everything is data specific and uh, you never want to overinterpret on, on a TSNE. But for example, is um, that every AML was a completely different island. And uh, you know, the only thing that sort of mixed in across samples that had sort of high sample entropy were like the T cells and sort of these healthy immune cells that were a minority in AML, which is all blast. But then we found a little you know, population of, of cells that, that overlapped across all the samples. Uh, and those were progenitor early, very primitive cells. We recently found the same exact uh, sort of mixed population. And those were progenitor cells of, of small cell lung cancer, which is a really, really nasty 
type of lung cancer. So um, again, with the TSNI or the UMAP, you use it to generate hypothesis. And then you go back to the high dimensional KNN graph and see you know, what's really going on there to make sure that, that your interpretation on two dimension uh, is correct. And, and certainly in, in healthy biology, definitely in, in, developmenting, in developmental systems, the progenitors come together. I've, I've, uh, you know, the, in, in, in gut epithelium, you see the progenitor uh, sort of uh, niche cells coming together. So yeah, it's a very strong signal. They're very distinct, as long as you collect enough cells. I mean, if you collect only a thousand cells and these are, you know, you, you sort of, it really depends on, on getting enough, enough cells, which is exactly why the numbers matter, even though, you know, we're making 10x way too rich. Uh. Good point. <laughs> Okay, that was a great answer. Uh, thanks, Juan, for this question. And a final one before we have to move on. Uh, this person does not identify himself or herself, but uh, thanks for the talk and uh, very illustrative in, on how um, this type of data works. And the person says, oh, it's nice to get some love for rare cell types. So uh, if, do you have any suggestions in case of comp computational analysis made from data obtained from public data sets from different laboratories? Uh, given that you talked a lot about how different samples were in general, uh, how much I, I suppose there are many here that's very hard to work from this public with using these public data sets. Do you have something to say about this? As I said, you know, work with computational person and biology person together. You know, I did show the, the, the tool by, by Malka Lucan that, that allows you to sort of benchmark different features of the integration. So you could see for a particular data set, one of the nice things about this tool that I had up from Malta Lucan, which I really like, is that it's like, okay, integrate your data set here, you know, run 20 different integration methods in a pipeline. Uh, there's about 20, and again, 20 is sort of a, an approximate number. Here's 20 different metrics that, that measure different trade-offs of, you know, mixing across batches, conserving clusters, conserving continuous biology, and now, you know, find the trade-offs that matter to you. Um, and, and, and always question, don't, uh, don't run something, don't run black box, even if you run some black box and reach some conclusion, you know, because you have to do something, you can't just freeze and say, this is complex, I'm not going to do anything. But once you say, okay, these are the five conclusions I want to write in my story. These, th these are my findings. This is, you know, one of the things about, you know, that's hard is there's so much, this data is so rich, but at the end of the day, you have to write a paper about something. So you say, these are the five stories I want to tell. These are my vignettes. These are my findings. Once you have such a finding, then you need to go back and say, did this finding depend on some of my processing choices? Is it robust to processing slightly a little uh, different way? So anytime we, we, we're reaching a point of, okay, this is what we want to publish. These are our findings. These are our stories. Then we go back and revisit and see, could how we process this data created these findings in an artifactual, incorrect way? And that's what you really have to do. You have to do something that's sort of good enough, go forward, explore your data, discover, and then go back and vet your discoveries. I think that was a great um, um, answer. And that, that, I mean, I hope everybody who's going to be joining us next week is here listening to that, because those are great points since we're going to be working with this public data sets and we have already encountered all those problems. And this view on how to go about them is really key for the success of uh, the analysis. I think that was a very, very good answer. Well, unfortunately we have to go, Dana. We are right on time here. It was really great to have you. It was great that you were patient enough to join us today. <laughs> yeah, and, and again, I, I wanna repeat the, the final thing, which I said at the beginning, you know, welcome, welcome to our community and, and please get engaged uh, with, the, with the global consortium. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hope to see you soon again in another opportunity. All right. Bye. Uh, so we are right on time here. Um, we will be moving on to our next speaker. Our next speaker is Talula Andrews. 
So Talola Andrews, she did her PhD in Oxford, studying the clustering of genes in the genome and, uh, and their relevance to, the gen to gen genetic disorders. Uh, she moved to the Wellcome Sanger Institute in Cambridge for her postdoc, working on developing tools to analyze single cell RNA seq data, including M M3 drop and S SC3. She's now a postdoc at the University Health Network in Toronto, working on single cell and spatial transcriptomics of healthy liver and liver disease. Thank you so much, Talula, for joining us today. Thank you. It's a pleasure and a privilege to be able to speak to all of you today. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to talk about some of my work looking at uh, the human liver, both in uh, health and in disease with a large variety of different technologies. So to start off, the, the liver is a unique organ. It's the huge metabolic factory of the human body. It does a whole bunch of different bio, uh, metabolic functions, it, accounting for 20% of oxygen consumption in the body. It's also uniquely regenerative. Uh, so you can cut out 80% of the liver and it will regrow in a few weeks to its full normal size. Um, and also because of its exposure to drugs and lots of toxins, because it's involved in uh, detoxifying the blood and clearing out all these drugs, uh, you can get a whole bunch of different diseases due to the sort of buildup of damage from these, these things, as well as from viruses that specifically infect the liver. So I'm going to start off talking with, about some of the data we've generated with the 10 Chromium platform. So this is a droplet-based single-cell RNA-seq platform where we have these beads it flowing through water that gets captured together along with uh, hopefully one and only one cell. Uh, although we also have droplets that will only have a bead and no cells in them. And then we uh, reverse transcript, transcribe and sequence the uh, transcriptome from each of these cells in each droplet. So this is a high throughput method. We applied this to uh, 24 healthy liver donors. So these are livers that are being transplanted out of a uh, deceased person and being transplanted into a living recipient. And we got uh, one portion of that liver uh, was given over to research uh, that we got access to. So we have uh, half and half males and females in a range of ages from quite young to uh, fairly old people as well as a range of body sizes and shapes from these individuals. So one of the unique features of this is that we get a whole caudate lobe. So this is one lobe of the liver that we get. Uh, and then we can use the existing vasculature within the liver and plug in our, our little syringes and pump the dissociation reagents into the tissue itself using the existing blood vessels. And this allows the reagents to get right into the cells without disturbing the tissue much at all. And once the cells have all dissociated from these reagents, we can just cut open this, the outer membrane around this lobe and all the cells fall out and we can put them on the 10X machine for sequencing. So as a result, we get this very nice complete map of the human liver. So we have uh, our hepatocytes over here. We have some T cells. We have some macrophages. We have some endothelial cells. We also have cholangiocytes, which are around the bile ducts, as well as stellate cells and uh, B cells as well. In total, we had 34 samples, accounting for over 100,000 single cells about half of which were sequenced with three prime single cell RNA-seq and 40% were uh, sequenced with five prime single cell RNA-seq. Between these different samples, so these samples were collected over the past four years uh, and they've had a whole range of different qualities of our, our process. So the, our initial samples had barely a thousand cells captured in each reaction whereas now we're getting consistently um, 
between five and 10,000 cells captured with each reaction, as well as, again, a mix of three prime and five prime technology, as well as slightly different versions of the uh, 10x chemistry and, of course, the cell ranger pipeline that's used to process this data. So in order to get this integrated map, I had to first do quality control, normalize, and then scale each sample individually, and then merge them and run the PCA and integration steps in order to really get all of these samples to match up to each other and, and form this sort of single integrated map, and then perform UMAP to get this beautiful picture. So I can look at the frequency of these different cell types, and I see I get lots of hepatocytes because we can be so gentle with our particular dissociation procedure, as well as a whole range of different cell types. So we get lots of macrophages and T cells and et cetera. But this global map, again, just using sort of the top 3,000 highly variable genes across all of these samples gives a very high level coarse grained clustering. Whereas if we go in and isolate each cluster again, and then perform the same pipeline just on the cells from that cluster, we can find many more subclusters and substructure within each of these larger groups. So here's just an example of the macrophages. So originally we only saw two different types of macrophages, but when we subcluster, we actually find three major cell types, uh, subtypes of macrophages, inflammatory, non-inflammatory, and antigen presenting. We also find uh, groups of activated macrophages down here, as well as uh, in uniquely phagocytic macrophages in this corner, and then in another corner that had a slightly different function as well. This is um, retinol-related uh, genes and that had a particular metabolic phenotype in that particular group. We also see some contaminating LSEC doublets uh, that we could not see in our global map. We can do the same thing with another cluster. So it's just another example. So here the B cells look like they're sort of one single trajectory. But if we subcluster this, we can see uh, we get a different cluster. We get a whole bunch of different clusters. And these clusters are characterized by different combinations of light chain and heavy chains that make up the B, B cell receptor. So each B cell will have uh, a receptor made of one heavy chain and one light chain. And there's two different versions of each one. And we have four clusters that correspond to each of the different possible combinations. We also have a cluster of proliferating B cells and B cells that are naive and haven't settled on their final B cell receptor yet. When we go and look at the hepatocytes, we know from the biology that inside the liver, it's structured as these sort of hexagonal lobules where we have a gradient of uh, flow from the central vein, uh, between the central vein and the periportal region. And we have a gradient of hepatocytes performing different functions along that gradient. So using some of those markers, we tried to uh, predict where along this gradient these cells would fall. But because this is single cell and we've dissociated these cells, we don't actually know where in the tissue these cells came from. In order to get that spatial information, we can complement our single cell RNA-seq data with spatial transcriptomics. So spatial transcriptomics, we have a plate uh, here, just a slide with these dots on it where we have barcoded uh, tags, very similar to the tags that would be on a bead in a 10X run. So those little tags that capture the RNAs, only now they're affixed to a particular spatial location on the slide. We can then, we then lay a slight thin slice of tissue onto the slide and then add the dis uh, dissociation reagents on top of it and lysis buffers to release the RNA, which is then captured by the spots. And then we can perform sequencing and library preparation exactly the same way as we did for single cell. Only now we have barcodes that we can map back to spatial locations instead of an individual cell. So here's just an example of what that looks like. So this is our slide. And here around the edge, you can see in red, the size of the dots for each of these barcoded spots. Uh, they actually cover the entire slide, but only the ones around the outside are uh, colored so that we can see them. 
And then placing the tissue slice on there, we can see these uh, structures where we have this central vein surrounded by this bright pink region uh, that corresponds to one of these central venous regions that gets to this darker purple color towards the periporal region. But now how do we analyze the spatial data? So we could analyze it exactly the same way we would analyze single cell data, doing dimensionality reduction and then clustering or um, some sort of pseudo time analysis. Um, but we have this problem that each of our spots is not a single cell anymore. So we have multiple different cell types added together, which means we'll have multiple overlapping patterns. So each spot won't necessarily belong to a single cluster, as we would say that a single cell would belong to a single cluster. So clustering doesn't work all that well for spatial data. We could try and identify spatially correlated genes. However, this is computationally pretty small. And it generally assumes we have large scale regions of the same cell type. Okay. So we ended up using, uh, which isn't necessarily true for the liver. In some tissues, that's, that's a good assumption to make. So we settled on using factor analysis. So this is basically like PCA, and we're actually, actually using this alternate called Verimax. So to explain what Verimax is, I'm just going to use an example of a horse. Uh, so if you do PCA, PCA tries to maximize the variability along each component. So the first component is going to go all the way from the left hoof all the way up to, uh, or the right hoof all the way up to the left ear. So it's capturing maximal variation, including some leg variation, some head variation from some left to right variation, and some front to back variation of the horse. Whereas what Verimax does is it rotates these principal components to try and maximize how specific each component is. So in this case of the horse, it would rotate it so we get one component that is specifically up and down variation and another component that is specifically front to back variation. And this is gonna let us pull apart these overlapping patterns that we see in spatial transcriptomics data. So here's just an example where we've applied uh, this very max uh, rotation to our principal component. So this is our primary major principal component now. And you can see that it's, uh, here are those lobules I pointed out before. You can see that it's capturing the difference between the pericentral and periportal hepatocytes in these lobules. And if we look at the genes that have the highest weight along these components, we find the same top marker genes that we saw in our single cell RNA-seq data. So we find these CYP genes, um, so all, all the dehydrogenase and, and some of these other genes, and then CYP2A7 and FOA1 uh, for our portal genes. Confirming that this gradient that we saw in our single cell data is indeed the spatial gradient between pericentral and periportal regions of the, uh, the liver. But what we noticed in our huge map is that some certain cell types are very underrepresented compared to others. Um, so based on imaging and histology data, we expect about uh, between one and 2% cholangiocytes, whereas we see less than 1%. And we expect to see uh, 15 to 20% of LSEX, and we see only about 6% of LSEX. So they're greatly underrepresented in our map. In contrast, the T cells are hugely overrepresented. So we expect only about 5% uh, of lymphoid or T cells. Uh, and we find more than 11% uh, of just AB, CD3, AB positive T cells. And we have other populations of other lymphoid cells as well. And this is likely because this is single cell RNA-seq. So we're having to dissociate the tissue and certain cell types are more likely to survive than others. In particular, T cells are much more likely, and other blood cells are much more likely to, 
to survive dissociation than these sort of structural cells that are very firmly stuck together. So in order to correct this bias in our map, we decided to add single nucleus RNA sequencing. So single nucleus RNA sequencing, we skip the whole dissociation. We can take either a fresh or frozen sample and simply purify the nucleus out of each cell and then perform single cell RNA-seq on that nucleus as we would if it was a whole intact cell. This is the advantage of being much less biased compared uh, due to dissociation than other uh, than single cell is. It can also be applied to any tissue regardless of how uh, difficult that tissue is to dissociate or not. But uh, the drawback is we're prim primarily getting unspliced immature nuclear RNAs. And whereas there's lots of post-transcriptional regulation of RNA, so different RNA lifetimes in the cell, in the cytoplasm that could be uh, affecting the expression that we see. So we might not see the same cell types or the same patterns. So to compare uh, how efficient single nucleus is compared to single cell for liver tissue, we took uh, more samples of, single, of healthy liver and we took half of them and froze them and then did single nucleus RNA-seq. And the other half we did uh, fresh straight to single cell RNA-seq. And this was from each sample, we took half of the sample. So we had perfectly matched data here. So comparing the two, we can, the first thing we notice is that single nucleus RNA-seq is much more sensitive than single cell. So here then we've got the total number of transcripts on the x-axis and the number of different genes detected on the y-axis, you can see for a single nucleus RNA-seq, we get many more genes per transcript than we get with single cell RNA-seq. And this is primarily because single nuclei uh, don't have nearly as much mitochondrial RNA or ribosomal RNA compared to the cytoplasm. The cytoplasm has a huge amount of mi mitochondrial RNA and ribosomal RNA. Um, and obviously the mitochondrial RNA wouldn't be captured at all with single nucleus and the ribosomal RNA is much less common in the nucleus than the single cell. However, when we try to integrate these together, we have a similar problem, as I mentioned before, with different samples. And that if we just put them all together at, from the start, these samples don't merge together at all. You can see here the single nuke and the single cell are completely separate. Whereas if we scale each data set individually and merge them together, we get a much closer matching between the two, but you can still see there's very significant differences between the single cell and the single nuke, even after accounting for these average differences um, due to um, differences in ampli amplification or uh, gene length or something like that, that would be completely systematic and the same across every cell. So looking at some of these systematic differences, we can see some of the ones I already mentioned. So here are the mitochondrial genes. Uh, so both the mitochondrial genome and mitochondrial genes encoded in the nuclear genome are much more highly present in single cell RNA-seq. Although most striking is the ribo transcripts encoding ribosomal proteins are hugely um, enriched in single cell RNA-seq and they're much more lowly detected in single nuke RNA-seq, which leaves a, many more UMIs and sequencing reads that can be uh, used to sequence long known coding RNAs and protein coding genes that are cell type specific. So one of the possible reasons we get these systematic differences is post-transcriptional regulation. So looking at the five prime UTRs and three prime UTRs, as well as microRNA binding sites, we can see a small relationship uh, between these different factors and the relative ratio of single cell versus single nuke expression. However, they're not the main drivers here. Contrast when we look at splicing, um, so the number of exons, the relative length of introns or the relative length of exons, um, these are much more strongly related to this single cell versus single nuke ratio. And most strongly of all was, single, was the intron length. Uh, genes with very long introns take longer to splice 
thus spend more time in the nucleus and are better captured with single nuc RNA seq than single cell RNA seq. So once we account for some of these differences, after merging the data sets together, we can finally integrate both single cell and single nuc together into a single uh, integrated map. Again, we can see the same major cell types as the previous map, only now we have different frequencies. Uh, so here the hepatocytes are roughly the same, but we get more, uh, more LSEX as well as more stellate cells and more cholangiocytes in the single nuc RNA-seq, whereas we get fewer B cells and fewer of these uh, NKT cells in single nuc than we did in single cell. We can look at the markers of each of these different cell types to see if they're consistent across both of these technologies or not. So here's, uh, here I'm using the Chicard index. Uh, so this is the intersection of the markers versus the union. And for the most part, they're fairly consistent between single cell and single nuc, with the exception of B cells and NKT cells, uh, where al almost all of the uh, main markers of these cell types are not detected uh, at very well in single nuc at all. Um, they're, they're just very lowly expressed, so they don't uh, become mark are, they aren't identified as significant markers anymore. But for the other cell types, it's all pretty, pretty consistent with 20 to 30 percent of the markers being both significant and in the same direction um, for each of these cell types. But when we subcluster this data, we can really see the advantage of single nuc over single cell in being able to capture rare cell types that were simply not present in the single cell data or present at such low frequency, we just couldn't see them before. So this is looking at the cholangiocytes, which were much better captured in single nuc than single cell. And we can see it's not just that the same populations were captured better, we actually get additional populations. Um, so we get this large group here of bipotent progenitors um, that was detected in single nuc and was very rarely detected at all in single cell. And if we clustered the single cell data by itself, we would not have been able to detect these cell types at all. The, the algorithm just would not have been able to distinguish them, whereas they're very easy to distinguish in single nuc. And we did some uh, slingshot pseudo time uh, trajectory reconstruction here. So as was mentioned in the previous talk, we don't know the direction that, uh, of these branches, but based on markers, we can see that these progenitor cell, this, this cluster here has lots of uh, expression of stem cell markers and progenitor markers. Whereas over here, we get more hepatocyte, uh, mature hepatocyte markers. And down here, we get more mature cholangiocyte markers. So changing gear a little bit, we can now look at some disease samples. So used, going back to this um, pattern I was talking about, where we have this progenitor cluster, this progenitor group that differentiates into both hepatocytes and cholangiocytes. When we're looking at liver cancer, we can get different um, cancer types depending on which of these cell types has acquired the mutations to become uh, transformed into a cancer cell. So the most common cancer, liver cancer cell type is hepatocellular carcinoma, which infects uh, the hepatocytes. Second most is the cholangiocyte carcinoma, which is when the cholangiocytes becomes transformed into a cancer cell. And then the least common is a hepatoblastoma, which is only seen in children and is a very rare disease. We find this fourth type of um, liver cancer, which is known as hepatocellular cholangiocarcinoma, which actually has, uh, is so known because it has a mixture phenotype in between the cholangiocarcinoma and the hepatocellular carcinoma. And it's not really understood where these tumors originate from. Uh, some argue that they are 
the result of mutations in this progenitor in adults. Others argue that it's actually two different tumors that have somehow fused together. And then others argue that it's one or other of these tumors that is transdifferentiating into the other cell type while also uh, becoming highly proliferative and metastatic and, and acquiring the cancer phenotype as well. So in order to look at the different causes and uh, phenotypes of these different tumors and the heterogeneity within them, we use this setup with our uh, wonderful collaborators who have just moved to Germany, uh, where they grow cells from primary, primary liver cancers in the in the lab into in 3D culture in order to generate um, liver tumor organoids. So this is very similar to how, if you know other organoids, very similar to generating a regular organoid, only we're using a cancer cell as the starting place rather than a healthy stem cell. So if we do this with healthy cells, we get these nice uh, round bubbles. Uh, whereas if we do this with cancer cells of different types, we get phenotypically distinct uh, organoids growing with a uh, histology and pathology that matches those seen in the original tumor. So here the hepatocellular carcinoma has this, this sort of raspberry-like phenotype, uh, whereas the cholangiocarcinoma carcinoma is this super dense uh, block and really oblong strange shape. And the mixed form is sort of in between. So for this study, uh, we didn't have the resources of the human cell atlas at our disposal. Uh, so we were limited to a much smaller scale experiment. So here we're uh, sequencing these samples on 384 well plates with SmartSeq2. So we've only got about 300 cells uh, from each, of each sample rather than the 100,000 cells I was showing before but we're still able to learn a lot about the system, even with so few cells. So our first examination was to try and make sure uh, we knew what kind of cancers uh, these samples really were. So we took uh, all of the samples together, we did PCA, and then we scored each principal component using known marker genes of each lineage and looked at the weight of those genes on each of the components. Now you can see that PC1 has this, is differentiating the cholangiocytes versus the hepatocyte lineage. Whereas PC2 was differentiating the stem cells and the hepatocytes from the cholangiocytes, and PC3, the hepatocytes from the stem cells. And then we simply recombined these principal components in order to get um, singular factors that represented each lineage. So here we took just this PC1 to represent the cholangiocytes. For stem cells, we combined PC2, 3, and 5. And for hepatocytes, we combined PC1, 2, and 3 in order to get one factor for each lineage, which we can then use to plot uh, this plot here, where we have each tumor in a different color here scored according to these different lineages. And you can see that those samples that we knew from the, the diagnosis from the clinicians were labeled as the combined form, have a very stem-like uh, phenotype, whereas the hepatocellular carcinoma has a very hepatocellular phenotype, and the cholangiocarcinomas had a very cholangiocyte-like phenotype. Confirming this sort of model, where we have uh, the HCC samples being derived from mutations in a progenitor cell in adults. However, this sample here was labeled by some of the pathologists actually as a combined form rather than a cholangiocarcinoma, even though molecularly it looks mostly like cholangiocarcinoma. But when we look more closely at it, we could see that it's actually not as cholangiocyte-like as the other cholangiocyte carcinomas. It's actually shifted a little bit more towards the hepatocyte side, which suggests it might be one of these forms that's undergoing 
this um, trans differentiation from a cholangist carcinoma to a hepatic carcinoma or the other way around. In order to confirm this, we looked at specific markers of these different lineages to see which of them are being expressed by this mysterious uh, mixed form. So here we can see the cholangiocarcinomas very highly expressing all of the cholangiocyte genes, the hepatocellular carcinoma expressing all of the hepatocyte genes, and this, these other mixed forms uh, highly expressing the stem cell genes here. So now looking at this mysterious one, we can go down its expression pattern and we find that it's expressing about half of the cholangiocyte marker genes, as well as a handful of hepatocyte genes, but it's, it has very low expression of the stem cell genes. So this hasn't reverted at all towards stem cells, uh, the, the stem cell-like phenotype. It's just going straight from the, between the hepatocyte and the cholangiocyte directly without any kind of reversion. So this is all sort of stuff we can see um, using bulk RNA-seq. We're not really taking advantage of our single cell RNA-seq at this moment. What we really wanna look at is the heterogeneity within each of these tumors. And specifically, we wanted to look for whether um, these cancers had something uh, referred to as a tumor initiating cell, which is essentially a stem cell, but for a tumor in this case, um, where these tumor initiating cells are supposed to be a subset of cells in the tumor that are uniquely able to regrow the entire tumor, whereas the other cells in the tumor do not have this capability. And they're of prime importance because if we use some sort of therapy that to treat the tumor that doesn't kill these ticks and it's only killing these other tumor cells, then we won't cure the, the cancer. We'll get reoccurrence when these tumor initiating cells regrow the tumor. Whereas if we use a therapy that can specifically kill these tumor initiating cells, we should be able to get, to get a full cure. So we asked, whether there are these ticks in our tumor organoids. So to answer this question, we first uh, assign whether each of these cells in each of the tumor tumoroids were proliferated or not. So for this, we just used the average expression of known markers of either G2M, G1S, or G1S, or um, not or G0. And then we used a Gaussian mixture model to assign, to find, uh, the, to model the bimodal distribution of the expression of these genes, and then assign cells as either in the group that has higher expression, and this is in G1S or G2M, or in the group that had lower expression, this is not in G1S or G2M. And we can assign each individual cell in that fashion. And we find that across all of our tumor organoids, only a, a minority of cells were actually actively proliferating. However, the proportion of these proliferating cells varied a lot depending on the particular sample. Um, so for instance, this was one cholangiocarcinoma that had a very high proportion of proliferating cells, whereas this other cholangiocarcinoma had a much smaller number of proliferating cells and when we went back to our wet lab collaborators, they were um, super happy with this because they had already knew that growing these cells in the lab, the, the cells from this tumor grew much easier and much more quickly uh, than the cells from this sample. And we could now explain why that was the fact. However, to find the other types of cells in each of these samples, we, were, we needed to cluster the cells. Now we could have, of course, tried to use SURAT. However, SURAT has been optimized specifically for high throughput 10x data. It has not been optimized to work well on SmartSeq2 data or small data sets, right? So we only have 300 cells here. We don't need the scalability of SURAT. We want something that's much more tailored to smaller data sets. So we developed this method called SC3 
traces consensus clustering. So whenever you do clustering, you have to make a whole bunch of different decisions in that pipeline. So you have to do uh, some sort of gene filter. You have to choose how you're going to measure the similarity or distance between cells. Yeah, you then do some sort of dimensional, dimensionality reduction. And then you have to choose how many of those lower dimensions you want to take forward and use to, in the case of SURAT, build a network. Although in, in the case of this tool, we just go straight to k-means clustering. And then you have to and then again pick the resolution that you're going to cluster the sample at. Are you going to use a high resolution or a low resolution or one particular value for that resolution parameter of whatever clustering method you're using? So instead of picking one answer for each of these options or in each of these questions, what we did with SC3 is just said, well, why don't we do a whole bunch of different ones? And figure out where the clustering results agree across all of these different options, as those are most like most robust clusters and are most likely to be correct, as they aren't um, dependent on any choice we made in our pipeline, because we we're taking average across all the different choices we could have made. So we have three different distance calculations, two different transformations. We use a range of about uh, usually about between 10 and 30 uh, lower dimensions. And then cluster using a bunch of different um, resolutions and then average across all of those. And, and then perform one last round of clustering on this averaged consensus matrix to get our final plus set of clusters. Applying that to our two more organoid data, we found that we get three major clusters in each of our different samples. So here I'm just going to show one example of the cholangia carcinoma, hepatocellular carcinoma, and the mixed form. Uh, but we see the same thing with the other three as well. And when we looked at the marker genes for each of these different clusters, we found that at one end of this sort of trajectory, we get cells that are highly proliferative uh, in all of the different samples, initiating cells. In the middle, we have cells that had a progenitor phenotype but were not actively proliferating, but nor did they have clear markers of mature either cholangocytes or mature hepatocytes, uh, depending on the particular tumor. Whereas at the opposite end, we had the most differentiated cells um, that either express cholangiocyte markers or hepatocyte markers, or in this case, um, they had sort of immature hepatocyte and cholangiocyte markers, not quite um, fully differentiated into either lineage. So based on that, we hypothesis that this might actually be better described as a trajectory. So uh, this plot is actually not a UMAP plot. This is a plot, nor is it a PCA plot. This is a plot of a diffusion map dimension, which is very similar to uh, what Anna was talking about with Markov chains, where it models um, the transition between different cell types and then performs PCA essentially on the transitioning uh, between the tr transition matrix between different cell types, between different cells in the network. And you can see that that lays out these clusters very nicely with uh, these tra uh, trajectories from the ticks to the differentiated cells. So now that we've got these different cell types, we can go back to, because these are cell lines and tumor organoids grown in the lab, we can go back and grow more and look at where these different cells are present. So here we pick out, we picked out a couple of markers, either of the differentiated cells or the tumor initiating cells or our putative tumor initiating cells that were highly proliferative. 
And then we found antibodies and did some immunofluorescence. So here we can see in red, the differentiated marker as present at one end of the tumoroid, whereas uh, KI67 for proliferating cells is at the other end. And here we looked at a marker of our ticks, <laughs> and again at KI67. And here they're overlapping. However, in this organoid, we didn't have quite as nice a uh, clean boundary between the proliferating and the differentiated cells in this case. But even with all of this evidence, we can't say that these proliferating cells are truly the ticks we're looking for, because we haven't shown that they're actually capable of regrowing these tumors. However, now that we've got these surface markers, we, <coughs> we can sort out these cells from each other and then grow them either in the lab or in a uh, immune uh, deficient mouse to see if they're capable of regrowing the tumors. So here's just our uh, flow cytometry plot where we're picking out those cells that either had, had, were expressing our tumor, our proliferative marker uh, for our tumor initiating cells or the marker of our differentiated cells or those, those cells that were expressing neither marker. When we sort those out and grow them on a dish to see, uh, in our 3D culture media, we find that those uh, here we're using minimal medium, so just the bare necessities for the cells to survive. We find that the differentiated cells never grow uh, new organoids, whereas the highly pr proliferating ones uh, very readily grow new organoids, and the double negatives occasionally grow new organoids. And this is just some quantification of that. I see the differentiated cells really do not grow new organoids in this medium, whereas the other, uh, the proliferating cells grow much uh, more easily. If we then take these cells and put them into a mouse and see if they grow tumors, we find a very similar thing. So here we ha have the proliferating tumor initiating cells. Uh, when we grow them in a mouse, within uh, three months, all of the mice have grown uh, tumors and very large tumors that are growing very rapidly. Whereas in when we inject the differentiated cells, almost none of the mice grow tumors. And finally, only one uh, grew any tumor at all. And it was growing much more slowly and began growing much later than when we injected tumor initiating cells, finally confirming that these are indeed tumor initiating cells. And when we looked at these tumors with uh, histology, we can see that they, this isn't just like a small lump, this is definitely growing a full uh, normal looking tumor with all sorts, the same sort of uh, phenotypic pattern that we would expect to see of the respective tumor type. Um, so this one in particular is a cholangiocarcinoma. Uh, and that's what, it, what you would see for a uh, cholangiocarcinoma in uh, any other sample including a, a human patient. However, what we accidentally discovered while doing this um, is that, it, um, well, everything we, I, I just said is true and that this works uh, well in minimal media, we, had, we started out originally growing these cells on expansion media that we had been using regularly to grow these organoids. And when we did that, we couldn't see a difference between uh, the differentiated and the tick cells, suggesting that there's actually some kind of plasticity here. So here, uh, when we sorted the uh, proliferating and the differentiated cells and grew them on this expansion medium, you can see that both uh, the differentiated and the pro highly proliferative ticks are able to grow new organoids in expansion medium. However, the highly proliferative ticks are still more readily, avail readily able to grow organoids uh, than the differentiated ones. So it's not a perfect reversion, but there is a degree of reversion occurring. 
And we see the same thing when we implant them into mice. So here, it's not that these cells need a constant uh, signaling from this expansion medium, really only about with as little as four hours uh, of keep growing these cells in the expansion medium, medium or exposing to the, them to the expansion medium before we injected them into mice resulted in the uh, highly differentiated cells growing tumors as quickly and as readily as the tick cells were. So this is a very quick uh, phenotypic reversion from differentiated into a, uh, a tumor initiating cell from these environmental cues. So we ended up with this model where we have these tumor initiating cells that then uh, that are highly proliferative in the, in culture and expand into likely expand into these uh, various more differentiated cells, uh, both progenitor and fully differentiated cells. But in the presence of uh, some growth hormones in the media, these highly differentiated cells can very quickly revert to this tumor initiating phenotype and then be able to regrow these tumors, which may be one explanation for how recurrence uh, occurs in human patients. So with that, I'd just like to thank all of my uh, collaborators and supervisors that made all of this possible. Um, so my supervisor Sanger, uh, as well as their collaborators that did the organoid experiments, uh, as well as my current supervisors. And any questions? Hi, Talila, that was a great talk. Thanks. Thank you so much for all these details on your work. That was really great. Uh, we do have a few questions for you. Sure. So the first one is from uh, Christina Silva Valera. Valerla. Uh, so thank you for the wonderful presentation. I was wondering whether you used frozen samples from pathology uh, rep uh, repositories for single nuclei or, and how does time of storage impact the data? Uh, we haven't yet, but that was the whole goal of that project was to figure out whether we could use the frozen samples from pathology and biobanks. And it looks like there's some degradation of the sample quality after a few weeks, but, after, but it's only a small amount. And after that point, it stays pretty much constant long term. So these biobanks, it's not going to be quite as good as fresh frozen or recently frozen data, but it's still good. So uh, the data that you were showing were um, uh, from tissues that you prepared specifically for this um, experiment. Yeah, these were specifically for this experiment so that we could have matching single cell RNA-seq data. So these were frozen, uh, I think, for about two days. Oh, before man. we did the single nucleus RNA seq, but we've mm -hmm. now been pushing that longer and longer, and we're going to try and get some from um, the local biobank to do that as well. Okay, I have a tag here from Alan that would like to answer this this question. Hmm. Uh, so I have another question here from Inacio uh, uh, Wickman. Congratulations for the talk. When you say cells were not present when you were using the single cell um, sequencing and compared to the nucleus, could the cell types represent just different cell states that you would that you would never see outside the nuclear? Um, That's resulting possible. from spliced and immature nuclear RNAs or it's possible but unlikely. Um, in this specific case, because we were using external de data and often protein-based markers to label the cells. So we know these cell types exist at the protein level as well. So for these particular cell types, we believe that they do, should exist all the way through from the nucleus to the to protein level. We just don't capture them with single cell. 
And uh, one of the reasons for that would be the coverage or uh, the other types of RNAs that you are including in the data set? Um, I don't think it's because of the coverage because we had similar coverage to in both single cell and single nuke data. And actually in our single cell data, we, had a, we have a huge range of uh, coverage and we don't see them even in the, the samples that had the highest coverage. Um, we think it's more likely to be due to dissociation related effects because the cells, many cell types in the liver are very sensitive to dissociation because it's such a regenerative organ, lots of the cells in the, the liver will prefer to self-destruct in apoptose or be killed in another way rather than sort of try and survive because they can just be easily replaced, which means it's a very sensitive tissue to, um, to dissociate. And really, as soon as you start handling it at, at, at all, some of the cells will start dying very quickly. All right. Um, and the final one before we, we have two goals, so we have here uh, um, another question for you. So another uh, compliment, great talk from Devika Argawal. When you say you combined the PC components to get a singular factor for the cell type, in your liver organoids, do you mean you summed the gene loadings for the lineage markers across those PCs? If not, if you could please elaborate. Thanks. Yeah, so I, I summed the gene loadings for the markers for each PC to score each PC as whether it's relevant to that lineage or not. And then when I combined the components, I actually added together the cell weightings for those PC components based on uh, the particular linear combination that would uh, represent each specific lineage. Okay, I hope this answers, but yeah, right, okay. So Talula, thank you so much for your participation. It was really great to have you. Please join us later if you want to um, uh, take a look up at the next lectures today and for the following days. Okay. Yeah. But thank you. Thank you. you me. Thank you. Thank you very much for your participation. So uh, with this, we finish our first uh, session of this meeting. Okay, welcome back to the afternoon session for our first day of this HCA Latin America single cell RNA seq analysis workshop. It is my pleasure to introduce our first speaker in this afternoon session, Dr. Ana Palmero. She's a legal and research ethics advisor at the Directorate of Health Research at the National Ministry of Health in Argentina. Ana Palmero holds a Juris Doctor degree from the Department of uh, Law in the University of Buenos Aires, Argentina, and was trained in bioethics in the Latin, America, Latin American Faculty of Social Sciences, the FLAXO. Since 2016, she is responsible for the research ethics programs of the Directorate of Health Research at the Ministry of Health Argentina, where she provides legal and ethical advice on human research to advance policies and regulations to incorporate research ethics in the country. She is currently a consultant with the Global Health Ethics and Governance Unit at the WHO and has uh, have served as consultant with the regional program on bioethics at the Pan-American Health Organization for the development of guidance to strengthen research ethics systems in Latin America during the COVID-19 pandemic. She is also a member of the Ethics Review Board of Médecins Sans Frontières, Doctors Without Borders, and serves on the steering committee of the Global Forum on Bioethics in Research. In Argentina, she serves as the coordinator of the National Research Ethics Advisory Committee of the Ministry of Health and is a member of the Research Ethics Committee of the Dr. Ramos Mejia General Hospital. She is also an external researcher of the Center for Studies of State and Society in Argentina. Her interests include human research governance systems and her current research focuses on biobanking and human gene editing governance. She will be talking uh, about ethics, biobanks, and cohorts. So 
please feel very welcome, Anna. We will listen to you attentively. Thank you, Enrique. Hi, everyone, and thank you for this invitation. Um, I will share my screen, just a second. Okay, here we go. Okay, um, today I'm going to talk with you about the ethical issues and governance frameworks of biobanking, and this through a perspective from Latin America. Just in first place, uh, as a disclaimer, these are my, my own point of view. These are not the point of view of the Ministry of Health of Argentina. And first, to start with, um, I'd like to share with you why I think it is important to promote biobanking in the region of Latin America. Uh, first of all, biobanks have become a powerful tool to advance biomedical research to improve health of populations by giving access to a great number of samples and associated data. Biobanks allow study of many diseases through correlation of genetic, environmental, occupational, and other uh, health uh, data, and that is why it is very important to promote biobanks with local samples and related data in the region to obtain new knowledge about our local conditions. And this is, it is well known that, for example, in genomic studies, failing diversity and there is very little contribution of data and samples from the Latin American uh, region. Biobanks also allow the maximization of the use of valuable samples that have already been obtained for other purposes. Uh, such as research of remnants of clinical or diagnostic procedures and also through donation. And uh, avoids having to collect samples again and exposing individuals to new discomfort. Well-established biobanks promote the use of samples and data in an open, transparent and accountable manner for the benefit of science and uh, society. However, biobanks have raised new ethical, legal, and social issues. Um, during during biobanking, donors and communities' rights, interests, and welfare must be guaranteed, and particularly the right to privacy, as it is becoming more difficult to de-identify the samples, and also the respect for autonomy. Individuals must authorize the use of their samples and related data for these future uh, uses. So these issues have resulted in new guidance and regulation. Best practices documents have been issued. Uh, for example, the ISDR best practices, the uh, recommendations for repositories, uh, which we have already the fourth edition. The first one was uh, from 2005. The OECD guidelines for human biobanking and genetic research databases and biobanks have been also recently incorporated in international research ethics documents, uh, such as the CIOMS International Ethics Guidelines for Health-Related Research Involving Humans, uh, which incorporated two guidelines in relation with uh, biobanks and databases. These are guidelines 11 and 12, and also the World Medical Association have issued declarations specifically regarding the health databases and biobanks in 2016. And also in national regulations, uh, particularly regulations regarding privacy and data protection and human research protection have incorporated the use uh, of, uh, of biological materials for future uh, research and some of them also biobanks. And um, so what is the ethical challenge? The question is how to ensure ethical biobanking that promotes research with social value. It's how to collect, store, use, and transfer samples and associated data ethically, and to promote research that improves the health of our own population. So the ethical issues uh, don't discuss in literature and included afterwards in this guidance and governance framework can be identified in the different stages of biobanking. 
uh, in the first place during the, the collection, the discussion has been focusing the model of the informed consent process that can be used during uh, for the collection of these samples for future uses in research. Uh, during the storage of this research, this uh, implies what is an adequate governance system and how this governance promotes transparency and accountability. Also, which mechanisms are in place to safeguard the privacy and the confidentiality of data and how, uh, uh, how the mechanisms for oversight of these future uses of samples and data is going to be and the communications and feedbacks with uh, the individuals and also the communication with the communities uh, from where they belong. Uh, regarding the transfer of these samples and associated data, the discussion has been uh, regarding the, the, the material transfer agreement and what uh, the elements of this, of this agreement should be. And specifically in lower middle income countries, there's been a great discussion regarding the transferences overseas, how to ensure that these transferences are fair and these are uh, determined in this agreement. Regarding the use, we have uh, the, the discussions have been focused on what, what entities should review the, the future proposals, how the confidentiality is safeguarded in this future uses, and how to ensure the return of data and results from this future research and the return also of, uh, of benefits. Uh, regarding the, the informed consent, in, in, in first place, it's important to remember that donors of samples for this, uh, the, the samples for this future research are considered study participants. So research ethic guidance are applicable to these future uses. In this sense, donors must explicitly authorize the future use of their samples by an informed consent process. The problem is that uh, because these are future research, this, this research is already is unknown. So it's not possible to obtain a specific informed consent as we usually do in any uh, research process. So the discussion was centered in uh, what is the proper mechanism to obtain informed uh, consent during the collection of these samples that are going to be storage for uh, future uh, research. So uh, the discussion went on on how to balance the donor's control over the samples with the burden for biobanks and researchers for development and mechanism to ensure this control. So, uh, you can see that the discussion went on through uh, the less burden and less control to more burden and more control. If there's no consent, uh, obviously there, there is less burden, but there's no kind of control uh, on, on these samples. Then we have the possibility of the blanket consent, which is considered consent for future uses with uh, no limitations, that the samples can be used or any kind of research in the future. And in this sense, it doesn't give any kind of control also for, for the donors. Uh, the, the other possibility was what is called the broad consent, the broad consent process, which is a consent for future research with specified limitations. And this has to go together with uh, a, a mechanism for oversight to know what is going on with these future uses of these uh, samples and associated data, and the possibility of ongoing communication between the donors and the biobank. Another option is the checklist uh, consent or, or, or the tier consent, where donors can choose which type of future usage studies they will allow. And uh, the last option, which is uh, with the one that gives more control to the donor but is, has the more burden to biobanks and researchers is the study specific consent, which means a, a, a consent for each specific future study. And finally, it was widely accepted that the use of broad consent was the proper option and its ethical acceptability relies on a system 
that includes oversight of the future uses according with what was promised in the constant process and also with ongoing communication uh, with the donors. So uh, what is exactly a broad consent? Uh, a broad consent addresses the range of future uses in research for which consent is given. It is not considered a blanket consent because broad consent uh, places certain limitations and conditions on this future use of samples. And these conditions are determined by the information given during the process of informed consent and also uh, in accordance with donor's interest and uh, preferences. In general terms, the extension information that's, that must be given for the collection of samples for biobanks, uh, the purpose of the biobank, the nature of foreseeable research uses this in broad terms, the possible choices that donors can exercise, for example, um, the type of disease that will be studied, the commercial uses, if there's going to be a uh, transfer overseas, and uh, the choices for using samples in, in controversial themes, uh, studies, for example, the productive research or type of tissues like gametes, or the techniques uh, like creation of immoral cell lines. Um, the condition of storage, the access and transfer of the material and governing issues, including when it will be necessary to recontact donors and uh, feedback concerning results or unsolicited findings that may affect donors' health and how this is going uh, to be managed and, and if there's some need for counseling uh, on this uh, respect. And also this has to be done respecting his or her right to know or not to know. And of course, like in any informed consent, the right to refuse the authorization and the withdrawal of uh, their consent. Um, as I said before, the ethical acceptability of this uh, process, this broad consent uh, process taking relies on proper governance, oversight, and ongoing communication with the uh, biobank. So um, how to ensure a proper governance system in a biobank? Biobanks must regulate at least the response of an institution. This is the uh, institution responsible for the collection and to ensure the rights, interests, and welfare of the donors, the purpose of the biobank, the type of research that is pursued, the type of research that may be excluded, um, how the informed consent is going to be managed, how it's obtained, how to withdraw this consent, and in which cases it will be necessary to recontact the donors. Also, uh, the, the, the processes, the mechanism to ensure confidentiality of data, specifically how to uh, protect the link between the samples and the donor's uh, personal uh, data. Uh, also, uh, there has to be mechanisms for communications, uh, as I said, uh, regarding unsolicited findings that can appear in, in future research, uh, how it's going to be these feedbacks with, uh, with the donors and the counseling that they, they could need, and uh, how the information about research outcomes is going to return to, to the biobank and to uh, the donors. It also has to be a process of quality assurance. These are the measures to control the quality of the material and data. Uh, and the access is, is important to determine the prioritization access and who will have access and under what circumstances. And what will be the entity that will review these future proposals uh, for using these samples and data. Regarding community engagement, this is also an important issue. Uh, how the, the biobank is going to inform the community about the recent projects that are, are being done with the samples and associated that data, and which are the activities that the biobank will uh, promote for uh, community engagement. Um, regarding uh, oversight of these future uses, the Research Ethics Committee played a very important role in this issue. All projects 
using samples must be previously submitted to a research ethics committee. And the committee must ensure that the proposed use of the material falls within the scope agreed by the donor during the informed consent process uh, during the collection of the sample. If it falls out of the scope, we consent if necessary or the project may be rejected. Um, there must be uh, times when a researcher wants to use samples stored in the past that perhaps they don't have a, a specific or broad informed consent or where it's not possible to recontact the donors uh, these after reasonable efforts have been made. And in these cases, the research ethics committee may waive the requirements of informed consent if these, cons these three conditions are met. In first place, research will not be feasible or practical without the weaver. Research has an important social value and research poses no more than minimal risk to participants or to the group to which the participants uh, below. Uh, it's important to know that researchers must justify these conditions in their projects and uh, the research ethics committees uh, must approve these, uh, these, these conditions uh, and that's the only way we can use these, uh, these store uh, samples. Regarding the, the transfer of this uh, biological material, uh, the transfer must be governed by a material transfer agreement. This is uh, an MTA. And this MTA must determine the scope and the limitations for the use of the material mm -hmm. and the rights and responsibilities of the party. And what do MTAs have to do with ethics? Uh, these agreements can be a tool to promote ethical sharing and use of samples by ensuring the compliance with the ethical responsibilities, which are owed to donors and their communities, and were captured in the uh, consent. Uh, in this sense, MTA must include clauses to protect the privacy and data confidentiality, and also to protect the interests of the biobank that provides uh, the samples. And MTAs can also promote fair partnership by establishing fair terms in relation to return of results and data and biobank acknowledgement and also the return of any other uh, benefits from this future uh, research. And regarding access to benefits, the research project must include the returns of benefits to donors and communities. Uh, what are considered benefits from research, uh, the data sharing and dissemination of results, the publication with recognition to the prior bank, also the return of results and unsolicited finding of these results. The return of results must be uh, given to the biobank and also the research ethics committee to inform the donors and the community. Uh, also a benefit is the possibility of training for the biobank staff and also uh, research ethics committees and the strengthening of research uh, uh, capacity. The, the, the specific capacity building objective to be negotiated in fair terms through dialogue between the stakeholders and these should be determined in the MTAs and if it is necessary, also in memorandum of uh, understanding. So these are the, the requirements that were established, uh, particularly in these uh, new ethics guidance documents. But now I wanna uh, share with you what is going on in, in Latin America and what are the challenges that we are facing to promote biobanking uh, in the in the region. Um, in first place, most of the countries have human research protection regulations, and they also have uh, ethics guidance. Many of them contemplate also the use of biological material, but for a specific research projects. And many also contemplate the storage of samples obtained in the project, in the research project or uh, future uh, uses. But 
Uh, however, there is no legislation or guidance in relation to biobanking. In the region, only Brazil has a comprehensive governance framework, and Argentina has recently just uh, a few months ago issued a, a ethical and technical guidelines uh, for biobanking. In the rest of the countries, there's no specific legislation or guidelines in relation to uh, biobanks. And this, uh, this means that in many cases, existing biobank researchers and research ethic on this have been left with the responsibility of taking decisions on their own. And this situation carries the risk of different standards being applied and adequate safeguards for the rights and welfare of research participants. And as a result, we can find in the region biobanks uh, working under international standards, mostly as a result of international collaborative work, and other biobanks with deficient governance systems not able to ensure ethical requirements are uh, observed. So there's a regulatory gap in the use of this biological material for future research and also for biobank uh, functions and, and operations. Biobanks as responsible of storage for future use of the material and data are not mentioned in the legal framework. There's no specific regulation on authorization, operation, infrastructure, and responsibilities to work done. There are no provisions for the use of biological material obtained in the course of clinical care or the use of this material stored for future uses. As I said, uh, in the region, we, we have only regulations regarding the use of the biological material in the context of research. And also another problem is that we were of consent for the use of biological material may not be permitted if the material is linked to personal information. And it is not clear if the legal framework allows this process of broad informed uh, consent. And although on the other hand, many biobanks use open consent, this meaning the, the blanket consent with, with no limitations for future use of samples. And furthermore, in these cases, the possibilities of contact with donors for future uses are uh, very low. And uh, regarding the MTAs, which uh, it is a very important tool to uh, establish the, the rights and obligations of the parties, there is currently no legal requirements for material transfer agreements. And it's very common that in international collaborative works, local research may not have the possibility of negotiating favorable terms related to uh, confidentiality or intellectual property rights and the return of results and access uh, to benefits. So there are many aspects uh, to improve. The, obviously, the development of a biobanking governance framework is a very important starting point to support the advancement of biobanking in the region. But however, there are many aspects to improve in order to promote local and international collaboration and as well as to protect the rights of participants and local researchers. Uh, regarding resources, it is necessary, first of all, to identify uh, research infrastructure that is required, such as technology, and the specialized personnel and their training needs to manage personnel, to manage, sorry, the biological material and data, and also uh, this platform, how data has to be uh, managed. Uh, there's also a need to promote data and sample sharing. Researchers may be reluctant to share the data because there's no clear regulation about ownership and responsibilities and also donors' protection. And uh, regarding ethics committees, uh, we could see that they are cautious in approving studies, particularly in international works in first place because broad consent may conflict with current legal framework. And in second place, due to mistrust from key serious expectations in LMIC. And um, regarding community engagement, 
uh, research is required to better understand the public views and attitudes towards public banking. This uh, to develop strategies for community engagement. Uh, we have to remember that without donors, we don't have any, any sample. So in this sense, public needs to be engaged in biobanking activities and need to be informed about what a biobank is and the importance to advance research uh, of our own populations and how the interests of donors and communities uh, are uh, protecting. And to finish, uh, moving forward, in order to sustain biobanking in the region, there is a need to, to develop a biobank governance framework and then to think about resources for infrastructure and specialized personnel to uh, achieve responsible samples and waste management, training for researchers to promote the benefits of ethical requirements, also training for members of ethics committees to ensure ethical review of studies and uh, broad consent procedures and strategies to promote the public trust in biobanking and uh, data sharing. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Anna. And he is going to be joining us for uh, for a few questions with you. Okay. It was a great talk. We hardly ever hear about such subjects in, in meetings like this, so that was very, very elucidating. It was very good. <laughs> Thank you, Patricia. Um, yeah, there he is. Yeah. Uh, let me go straight to the questions. We have a couple of questions here and other questions from the from the panelists. So, first question: uh, Well, congratulations. What happens with the consent if the patient dies? Does it stay in the same category? What happened if the consent was of the type in which the patient must reconsent for each study? That's a question from Laura Gomez Romero. In first place, that, that's why uh, these new ethical guidelines are asking for a broad consent process in order to avoid this case-by-case uh, -case consent for future uses. And in, uh, in the case that the person uh, didn't uh, express the will to, for the use of these, uh, of, of, these um, of, of their samples and data for future research, uh, in, in that case, is maybe it will be needed to have uh, an approval of the ERC for this waiver of consent. And if the person had already uh, give, given the, the broad consent for, for this use, it can be used wherever if, if it's already died. I don't know if that was clear. Uh, yes, I, I guess so. So okay. <laughs> whenever uh, the patient dies, like the consent, the consent already given is taken for granted? Yeah, exactly. If, if, if there was a broad consent process from the beginning, from the moment when the, the, the sample was collected, uh, this has to be clear, informed during that process. That this is something that is useful to ask for, uh, for the donor in the moment when the, the, the sample is collected. So okay. that, that's why it's useful this this broad consent process and not the specific informed consent for each use. Okay, and if uh, the patient has to uh, reconsent every time that the, the, the sample is used for a different study, even if under an uh, umbrella project or something, what happens when, when the patient dies? So the, the, the sample is no longer usable for further studies that are not previously consent? If, if the person has explicitly 
uh, not given his authorization for uh, these cases, it won't be uh, possible to use the sample. But you have, uh, there's always this possibility of asking a waiver of consent if this is justified and these three conditions have to be met. It has to be with the value of the, of the research, the importance of the, the samples that are going to be used and the possibility of asking for informed consent. So now th there's, uh, there's a change uh, in, in regarding this uh, specific informed consent for each type of use and is this uh, thinking about this broader informed consent process. So uh, as if, if the, the research has minimal risk and a very important social value, and this has to be uh, reviewed by a risk ethics committee, in these cases, the, the samples can be used for the future research. Okay, so the, the research ethics committee is, uh, let's say, has the capabilities or, or the authority or authorization to waive consent exactly. under certain circumstances? Under certain circumstances, exactly. Okay. And these are these 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 conditions are established in in these uh, uh, ethical guidelines. And the, the last one is the CEON guidelines. Uh, as I said, the guideline eleven is very clearly in what uh, the 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 importance of using these future samples. So it's, it's like a, a, a change uh, regarding the, the respect of autonomy and the common good. So this is something that the research ethics committee has to balance when they do their reviews. Okay, well, thank you. We have another question. Uh, great, day, great, great talk uh, from Sebastian Urquiza. We never hear about these topics. How do work, do we work with samples, and that, that's an important question from, from the context of the HCA. How do we work with samples from different countries simultaneously? I mean, who collects the consent on, on these uh, consortia, international consortia that are uh, every, every time are more and more common? So how to comply with, with the local laws and, 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 and the general spirit of these consents? This is, this is currently a... Uh, uh... A, 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 a great discussion because uh, what researchers have to do, uh, they have to know and comply with every regulation of each country that participates. And that's really a, a lot of burden for researchers and also for research ethic committees that have to review this, this uh, project because they have to be aware of what is going on with the regulations in other countries. That is why there's a, a big call for some kind of unity regarding the, the requirements for this transfer and use of biological materials. I think we are going to there, but <laughs> actually now we have to, to look for every regulation in every country that is participating in the project. Are there plans for, for some kind of international agreements, like let, let's say the WHO uh, gathering uh, experts from different countries and like forming a consensus or something? There's been many discussions about that. Um, unfortunately, in the middle, we have a COVID pandemic and that has been not discussed, but I think we are going to, to there because also regarding these agreements, there are a lot of legal things there and the burden, the, the economic burden of doing all these reviews is, is very high. So I hope that we can achieve uh, some international agreement about this thing. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have uh, further questions. It actually, it was a quite new topic for, for many of us. Thank you for the talk. What's your perspective on patient-derived organoid biobanks in terms of international experience? Do they subscribe to the same regulations as sample biobanks? And is there any previous experiences in, in these regards in Latin America? Uh, if, if, if the biobanks, it's important to understand that all these uh, requirements and the ethical guidelines are regarding to biobanks for research purposes. So if, if, if any biobank of any kind has in, in, in its goal or in its mission the, uh, the, the, 
are foreseen to, to do future research, they have to uh, uh, comply with all these ethics uh, guidelines. And I don't, I, I certainly experience in Latin America. Um, actually, I don't, in here in Latin America, there are a lot of biobanks and there are also networks of biobanks. But regarding ethical issues, uh, I think we need to work a lot because this is something that um, it, we really need to, uh, to go to uh, governance frameworks that include the, the ethical aspects. And in, 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 this, in this sense, I think we can, we can work in the region uh, to achieve a, a, a common guidance regarding the, the ethical aspects of biobanks. Okay, thank you. Ah, thank you. Uh, uh, that, that, this, this one's already answered. We have a, a couple more questions. Uh, what's your, uh, no, no, that's the one on the biobanks. Uh, well, I, I have a personal question actually, and, and perhaps it's, it's a broad question, but I, I guess it's central for, for the things we need to consider in projects such, such as the HCA. Uh, I mean, informed consent is, is, is a tricky concept because it means that the people who is giving consent actually understands the scope and, and, and the limitations and, and all the things related with the studies. So what happens with complex studies uh, in, in biomedical research in genomics and, and, and in this uh, science sometimes this explaining to a general audience to, to uh, the population the open population these uh, broad uh, concepts let's say molecular biology and information protection and confidentiality I mean the, the problem with, with the 23 and me issue that people were able to they identified uh, the uh, different aspects of the confidential data, but it's actually a debate. So this is particularly important because in, in the context of the HCA, some of our subjects are not even patients. I mean, are open population because we're sampling normal tissue. So if it's already difficult to do so with, with uh, actual patients, with people who is a, a little bit informed about their condition, but with open population, how, how can we, I mean, we, we may write down as uh, some document and people may sign it because they want, but they are not really informed. So how to cope with this in an ethical yeah. way? That's why it's important the community engagement strategy, particularly in our region, there's very few information, not only regarding this kind of research, uh, I think in research in general, there's no uh, information for general public. And I think this is essential. Um, it's very, I, I, under, you, uh, I also understand that it's very difficult to inform the kind of, of research uh, that, you, that you do. Imagine I'm a lawyer, so <laughs> it's difficult for me to also understand uh, all the kind of research that, uh, that you do. So, it, it's very important to, to have community engagement strategies, uh, not only in the sense of uh, informing uh, uh, the community, but also to have feedback with them in order to, to understand what, what they think and what they need to know about this research. Many times it's not about the technical understanding of what is going on, but uh, and to understand why this is done and what, what are the, the goals and, and why this research is undertaken. I think it's more important to understand that this kind of research promotes the advance of health population. And that is very important because uh, many times that is not understood uh, by the general public and there's this uh, misunderstandings about or misinterpretations about what research is uh, what are the uses of these samples and this data? So uh, I think researchers in general has to, to have this uh, social look <laughs> of what 
uh, their activity side and to promote and to go with general public and explain what they are doing and why they are doing that, and why this will benefit uh, all as a society, especially in our region. Yeah, and, and talking about our region, uh, another instance that, that has been become uh, complex, and, and for, for instance, some, some years ago, uh, I, I myself participated in a, in a population genomics study involving indigenous populations, but this may happen not only to indigenous, perhaps to disabled populations, uh, people with, with some kind of, of impairment or disability. How can we go even further on these issues, even with disadvantaged populations or with, with the cultural and language barriers, such as the case of indigenous populations? Uh, I think that in, in that cases, the, there's a need to have uh, this um, multidisciplinary view of research, and there's a need to work with social science researchers um, to, to engage and to understand what are uh, the questions and the concerns of these populations. Many times there are cultural things that uh, we don't understand, we don't have why to understand, that is why it's necessary to, to do this kind of research, this social research to, to know and to understand what the concerns of these uh, particular groups are and how uh, to promote this uh, research in a, in, in a social sense, that it has a, a social value for them. So uh, it, it, it is important to work in, in in this multidisciplinary uh, view, not, not only with, uh, uh, with this uh, technical view, but also engaging social science researchers in this kind of project. And do you think that in Latin America, we are actually reaching this goal? I mean, we are working along the right direction in this, in this regard? Uh, I think there's been a lot of advance here in Latin America. Uh, this discussion regarding biobanks is something that has many years, but I think we have a particular problem that is a political problem. You know, this, uh, this need to, to promote research in the region it has to be uh, a policy in, in, in our health authorities. So many times these, advance, these disadvantages are, are, are slow and uh, many times they are not seen because there are not no clear uh, policies regarding uh, research in general. So uh, I think we are better. I think there are many groups that are working, uh, following all these uh, guidelines and with international st standards and are participant, uh, participating in, in very important collaborative work. But there's a need to understand that uh, this kind of research is, is important for, for, our, for our countries and there has to be part of the political agenda. Okay, well, thank you. It, it was a, a quite enlightening uh, talk and discussion for many of us. We are not uh, so familiar with these uh, subtleties of the, of the ethics of, of biobanking and sampling. And of course, uh, it's, it's always refreshing and enlightening to, to listen to these concepts. Thank you very much, Anna. We are moving on uh, with our ne next speaker for today. I have the pleasure to introduce Professor Alfredo Hidalgo Miranda. He is the research director at the National Institute of Genomic Medicine in Mexico. He has a bachelor's degree in biology and a PhD in biomedical research from the National University of Mexico. Uh, Dr. Alfredo Miranda heads the Cancer Genomics Lab at the National Institute of Genomic Medicine in Mexico City. His research is focused in, on the identification and characterization of genomic alterations in human cancer with a particular interest in breast tumors, where his lab has participated in the description of the genomic landscape of breast tumors from several different and integrative perspectives including whole genome, whole exome analysis uh, in Mexican and Latin American patients, as well as a deep uh, understanding, the, the search for a deeper understanding on the role of long-coding uh, long RNAs in breast tumorogenesis. 
and the characterization of tumor heterogeneity in different subtypes of breast tumors. So uh, Alfredo will be talking to us about uh, the very important issue of uh, cancer genomics and how these uh, tools of single cell analysis may allow us to, to go deeper in the understanding and hopefully in the prognostics and diagnostics in, in, in cancer. So it's, it's a pleasure to have Alfredo here and you have all our undivided attention, Alfredo. Well, thank you very much, first of all, for the invitation. I think the Human Cell Atlas has been one of the most important uh, projects that is going on now for uh, several years. I was very excited when uh, uh, the, the broad started this, this project. I think it's amazing that we really didn't really know what, 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 what type of cells are composing our body. So it's, it's a major step forward to see what they have been doing. And hopefully we can contribute from Latin America for this effort. I should start uh, by saying that uh, I actually I am I am I am not by any mean uh, an expert in single cell genomics. I'm just a bystander and a, an interested a reader of what they have already done. But uh, hope you take this into account if I make some mistakes. But uh, anyway, I think uh, from the from the perspective of what can be done in 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 cancer with single cell genomics. I think there are a lot of opportunities out there in order to better understand several things that are key aspects for understanding how cancer develops and how cancer invades and how cancer can develop these uh, uh, strategies for um, uh, resistance to, to different types of, 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 um, of treatments. And uh, finally, unfortunately, in most of the cases uh, can end up with a life of patients. So cancer has been something that has been very, very, uh, that has benefited a lot from, from, from genomics. And this is also the case for single cell analysis. So uh, I will just... Uh, I will, I will try to, to share my screen. Just a second. Let me check if I if uh, it's here already. Okay, thank you very much. So, can you see my screen now? Yes. Okay. So uh, this talk will be based on uh, several, uh, I think, cornerstone uh, uh, papers that have been using um, single cell sequencing. Uh, since 2014 and so where they began using this kind of methods for the first time in order to first analyze uh, copy number variation in and alterations in human cancer. And then they apply this situation to the architecture of, of normal tissues. And, and, and then afterwards, how uh, single cell genomics has been used for uh, the, the purpose of this, uh, of this workshop, which is, uh, uh, the analysis of gene expression at the single cell level and how it has impacted our knowledge of both the normal architecture of, of, of normal uh, uh, tissues and how this is reflected in the history of cancer. So, for example, uh, the, the, we know right now that uh, the, the, most common, the most common accepted uh, theory for cancer development is that cancer is a disease of the genome and that this disease results of the accumulation of different mutations throughout time. So once we are a, 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 a cell that has been uh, generated uh, by the, uh, during, during conception, uh, the, 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 the simple fact that DNA is replicating and the cell is dividing will by, by chance, uh, uh, the DNA will be accumulating different mutations. If these mutations are in genes which are not important for tissue development, for cell uh, differentiation or for cell uh, division, you might live with them and you will not uh, get a, a, a cancer resolution. Uh, as soon as you, as we are born, we are, we are exposed to different types of uh, mutagenic uh, insults 
for example, the, 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 the UV light from the sun, or if you are a little overweight, you might also have this tumorigenic uh, environment. Uh, and this will increase the chance of mutation. And if these mutations uh, now uh, hits a gene that is really important for DNA uh, uh, repair, for example, as P53 or some other uh, um, tumor suppressor gene or oncogene, then this, will mutation, this mutation will have an impact on how the cell is dividing. And they might be uh, uh, the, the first steps in the generation of a new tumor. So the, 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 the mutations that, that can be uh, detected in genes which are not commonly related to cancer, these are called the, the, the passenger mutation. They're just a standby in, in the cell. And the, and the mutations which really affect genes involved in cancer are what we know as driver mutations. And the combination of driver mutation at the long run is what generates the cancer. We should not forget that cancer, it, it, you can have some uh, cells with a, uh, with a driver mutation, but that does not really represent that you will develop a cancer. You really need a number and a combination of different mutations, which will increase also the, the uh, um, genomic instability at the chromosome level in order to, be to develop a tumor. And uh, as the tumor uh, evolves, then the, the, the tumoral mass is not composed by a single clone. They are different clones composing a tumor, every each of, the, of, of these clones with different genetic background. So you have like a population of clones which, are, uh, uh, which can face differently uh, uh, different, uh, um, uh, different uh, exposures. For example, when you use a treatment, uh, some of the clones will be responsive to this kind of treatment, but some other not. This is called an uh, intratumoral heterogeneity. And this is a very important situation for the clinical management of patients because we usually use different combination of drugs in order to kill most of the, of the dominant uh, uh, clones in a tumor. But sometimes some of these clones uh, might be uh, resistant to this type of, 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 of treatment and they will recur or they will form um, uh, metastasis in the long run, no? So this is a very important concept in cancer this intratumoral heterogeneity. And of course, until very recently, we didn't really have the tools in order to understand this kind of heterogeneity. The first tools that were applied to understand this heterogeneity was bulk sequencing of DNA from a tumoral mass. And you were, you were expecting that you will be sequencing enough uh, 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 with enough depth, depth in order to, de to detect the mutations that are common in at least 1% of the cells that you were sequencing. But this was also this was all this was only an assumption, a mathematical assumption, because you were not really able uh, to 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 identify the mutation presence for different clones in a single in a single tumor. This only came into reality with the use and application and development uh, of single cell sequencing, and that's why it's very important this this kind of methodologies to understand both the genesis and the, and the evolution of the tumor. And we also have a very important role in how we can deal with this, uh, uh, with this uh, intratumoral heterogeneity, how we understand it, and how we can use this information derived from single cell sequencing in order to better, to better treat the, the cancer patients. So as I just mentioned, cancer is a heterogeneous disease. You can see this uh, from, from the beginning. Every patient is a different uh, history is a different history of the disease. It's a different history regardless, regardless regarding to the, the, the treatment response that you see between patients. But it is also a, a, a heterogeneous disease at the molecular level. In the, in, in, talking about breast cancer, the, the test that you have to do in order to detect which patient will receive its treatment will be either through the identification of the expression of certain proteins, the estrogen and progesterone receptor, or the amplification of the HER2 uh, knee, uh, gene, uh, which in, in this case will also result in the overexpression of the ERBB protein. And in this case, you will uh, select, depending on the combination of the positivity of these markers, which type of therapy you will be given to a, a particular uh, patient. No? And from this uh, analysis of the immunohistochemical level or the in situ hybridization level, it becomes evident that cancer is, is a heterogeneous disease at the molecular level. Some of the, of, the, of the areas of a particular tumor might be positive for one of these markers, but the clone next to it might be negative. So we have to do a, a balancing act with the pathologist in order to say, 
how, how what's the percentage of, of, of cells that are positive for a particular marker where you will decide therapy and you know in, in that way you you will be able to to define if this patient will receive the the, the target the therapy or not the thing is that it, it, it's quite evident that in the single tumor you uh, several types of, of clones are uh, living together and they are all exposed to different um, uh, environments and this will be very important for tumor development afterwards. Uh, a tumor, intratumoral heterogeneity, then we should take into account also that the tumor is not really a mass of 100% tumor cells. The normal cells, the stromal cells, the infiltrating tumor cells from the, from the, from the uh, the immunological system, and also all the, the, the scaffold, the matrix that gives a, 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 a structure to the tumor, they all play a very important role in tumor development. You, we tend to, to think of cancer just as the cancer cells, but it's just a very complex microenvironment that you have to take into account the, the correlation between the tumor cells and the stroma, the correlation between the stroma and the, and the immunological cells that are uh, in the tumor or surrounding the tumor, because all these interactions that's what, what really uh, sets up the, the, the stage for tumor development. And uh, as, we, as we already know, uh, they have a very uh, strong impact, for example, for the progression of a disease. In breast cancer, those tumors that are uh, um, infiltrated by, by, by um, immunological cells, they have a better prognosis. So we know that this composition, this complex mixture of cells in a tumor uh, uh, is very important for treatment, for risk scoring, and also for the development uh, of the posterior, of the, the posterior uh, development of the tumor. Until now, we didn't really have any option to, 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 to analyze these cells uh, separately. What we did, as I just mentioned, was to take a, 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 a biopsy of this tumor, hope that it would contain more than 60% uh, tumor cells, and we just blend the tumor in order to extract all the nucleic acids and use this complex uh, mixture of nucleic acid to, to run a sequencing experiment. And then you, you will have to, to check how many times you read a particular sequence in order to calculate the allelic fraction for example, to, to, to analyze these mutations that are uh, very uncommon or that are, very, uh, that are present only in a very small fraction of the, of the tumor clones. But still you were not able to see which kind of, 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 uh, what kind of genes were expressed by each of the single cell, of the single cells populations that are uh, composing the tumor. There are several options for doing this with, with, uh, with uh, bulk uh, sequencing, for example, with RNA-seq. Several algorithms have been developed in order to try to identify which kind of immunological cells are expressing what things, and there might be a relation of the gene expression that you got from the mixture of RNA to see which kind of cells are present in the tumor. But of course, this is not enough if you really want to go for a deeper understanding of the, of the composition of a tumor. Uh, for that, you will need to use single cell analysis, but this is also very complex in a, in a in a clinical environment to get the samples that are very that are, will be useful for uh, for the this uh, for, for um, taking up the cells and uh, to keep them viable in enough numbers in order to have to run this kind of experiment. So you really have to be very careful when you collect your samples, and you really have to treat the the, the biopsy very well in order to maintain the the cells alive and get nice uh, uh, RNA seq experiments from this kind of tissues. So the idea is that you will disgregate the, the, the solid tumor to get a, 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 a cell suspension. And then you will use different uh, types of equipment. In this case, this is a chromium from 10X, which is one of the most used uh, equips for this. And then you will do sequencing. Now, in this case, it's uh, uh, in the example, it's single cell uh, RNA sequencing. And then you will be able to obtain a particular uh, uh, a measurement of gene expression from if, from each of different clones that you will uh, uh, that were present in the tumor. Uh, as I told you, I'm not an expert, but this is the type of graphs that you will find, and you will be able to cluster, use clustering uh, algorithms in order to identify how many uh, cell populations are present in a particular tumor. And a very interesting thing is that you can see at the cellular level. Uh, how many more or less cells comes from the from um, epithelial tissue, which are cells, uh, cancer cells? 
which are immunological cells. And this will give you a much better understanding on how these cells interact in, in a particular tumor. Uh, now I will uh, I will pass to, to some examples of, of, of what how, how do I, how, what we've learned using these single cell approaches. Uh, this one is a particularly interesting, at least for me, uh, experiment that they've done in, in 2014. And uh, it's, it's actually published in, in, in 2015, uh, where they uh, analyze the structure of uh, normal uh, skin. This is a group uh, from, uh, from the Sanker. And what they did is not really actually single cell genomics, but it's close to it. They, they as you can see here, this, 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 this patch of skin comes from the eyelids uh, after blepharectomy when uh, it's an aesthetic uh, uh, procedure you get this, the, 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 the skin from the, from the eyelids. And what they did was take uh, micro, uh, microbiopsies, which they uh, uh, analyzed by deep, deep sequencing. They analyzed two and 234 uh, the biopsies, and they sequenced 74 genes, at least at 500 eggs. And uh, it, it was very interesting because this skin is still functional. This is normal skin in all senses. It's a functional epithelium and it's working fine. It was not retired because of disease, not because of cancer. It was just a, 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 an aesthetic procedure, you know? So they weren't really expecting to find a lot of mutations. And the surprise was that there are a lot of mutation in the normal epithelium. And they found even uh, up to 10,000 mutations per cell. And several of these mutations are driver, known driver mutation for skin cancer. So uh, uh, what we learned with this paper is very interesting because we know now that at least uh, 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 sun exposed skin is a reservoir for a little, a lot of, of potentially uh, driver mutations. But uh, fortunately, they, we still, they still do not have the combination or the number of mutations which, re which will result in a tumor. We don't know how, many how much time will it take to develop a tumor from, from, from this uh, uh, background. But what we really know and we learned with this paper is that the normal tissues are a mixture. They are a clonal mixture of different mutations. Almost every single cell has a different type of mutation. And in most cases, we will be able to find cancer-related mutation, even though this is a normal functioning tissue. And when they compare the amount of mutations, the, the, the mutation burden that they found in the, in the, in the normal uh, tissue compared with other tumors, it was a striking because the number of mutations that you find that the burden of mutation that you find in the normal skin is comparable even to, 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 to skin cancer or to, or, or, or to melanoma, no? So this is a very interesting uh, situation where uh, 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 it's not, uh, as I told you, single cell genomics, but it's close to it. And, and deep sequencing can, can tell us about the structure of, of, of the normal tissues, no? And how these uh, alterations that we find in the normal tissues will be related later with the, with the development of cancer. Uh, apart from this paper, they also analyzed, well, they, they, they asked, they, they, they questioned the thing that, uh, well, of course, the skin is UV, is UV exposed, so you will find a lot of mutations associated with UV, but what happened with an epithelium that it's not really exposed to UV? We will find the same thing. And what they did was to, to, to repeat this experiment, but now in a normal esophagus, uh, they, they took biopsies from different uh, patients at different age uh, uh, from their esophagus, and they identify actually that uh, the mutation load grows over time, and that uh, as soon as we get uh, a little bit older, up around 40 years or so, the, the number of mutations that, that we accumulate in our, in our normal tissues uh, becomes higher every, every year. No? So as you can see here, this is an, a, 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 a graphical representation of how many mutations you will find in a centimeter of, 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 uh, of esophageal uh, epithelium. And you see clearly that uh, as, uh, uh, when uh, the, the higher the age, the highest the number of mutations, which are also related with genes that are commonly associated with esophageal cancer. So this is a confirmation that, uh, that these mutations are part of the normal epithelium. And of course, if you are exposed to different mutational uh, insults, for example, smoking or drinking, the number of mutations that you will see in this normal epithelium will increase. 
Afterwards, uh, this was also validated in blood. This is, a, this is a, a, an example of what is called a, a clonal hematopoiesis. Uh, if you sequence enough uh, some uh, cells or if you sequence it with enough uh, uh, depth, the, the, the DNA from blood, you will see that accumulation of mutations with age is, is a common uh, expression. No? Uh, you normally see uh, the number of mutations that we have in our blood um, statistically doubles every 10 years. So this is also related with the aging of the hematopoietic process. No? And this is very important, particularly for another application or potential application of single cell sequencing, which is the analysis of liquid biopsies through the analysis of uh, um, uh, circulating tumor cells. You have to really be aware that the mutations that you are identifying using this kind of approaches really come from the, the cancer cell and are not a, a, a result of this uh, clonal hematopoiesis that you will see with age. Um, every time uh, you are getting more application of single cell genomics for the analysis of, of circulating tumor cells, and you really have to be very careful how do you discern between a, a mutation that is from the tumor and a mutation that is just a result of aging of the normal uh, 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 hematopoietic system. Uh, uh, this is also very important because we really have to know, and there are different, different uh, 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 hypotheses of how can the evolution of cancer uh, uh, is taking place. And it will depend on different amounts of, uh, of different types of information. It will depend on the size of the lesion. It will depend on the number of clones that you can find in a tumor. And as you can see here in this animation from a very recent paper in Nature Communications, different models and different numbers of cells and clones and the size of a particular clone will be a, a very important step defining how the tumor will evolve and how many heterogeneity you will find in a, in a big tumor. So the idea is that uh, the message is that we don't really understand yet how this, the size of a lesion and the number of different genetic clones in a particular lesion will impact later the, the genetic heterogeneity of a tumor and how this heterogeneity will impact the, the, both the clinical course and the, and the treatment of this kind of tumor. So this is an, a very interesting and very active area of research where single cell genomics will be uh, uh, the most important tool to understand this diversity and how this diversity changes through time with, uh, uh, with the evolution of the disease. Uh, next, we, I, will, I will talk about uh, this, 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 this uh, analysis that we just mentioned were based on, 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 depth, uh, on a low um, depth of coverage of the sequencing. Uh, uh, but the other thing that you can do using single cell genomics it's uh, this method that is single nucleus sequencing. And this was one of the first examples where you wanted to, where we, they, they made a question of how much uh, copy num somatic copy number aberrations are present in a, in a single tumor. And for that, they used uh, two tumors, one, uh, one, um, uh, one breast tumor, which was positive for, for, for estrogen receptor and what we call the triple negative tumor, which do not express any of the, of the markers that you use for, for, for treatment selection, and they are more aggressive. So what they do was take different section of the tumor and then uh, get uh, nuclei suspensions that they will later separate it using uh, a, a, a flow cytometer in order to identify which, some, which nucleus contain uh, the double the DNA, which were aneuploid and which had a normal ploidy, and then use that uh, uh, to, to, for sequencing, a very shallow sequencing pass in order to get at least the copy number information from the cells. With this kind of approach, you don't really have uh, point mutations because for that you will need uh, more sequencing, but they got enough sequencing to calculate the copy number uh, alterations that you see in a tumor. Copy number, uh, 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 somatic copy number aberrations is very common in cancer. And this is just a gain or loss of, of particular segments of chromosomes during cancer progression. And it is one of the hallmarks of cancer, this uh, uh, genetic heterogeneity and this uh, uh, um, genetic instability uh, that is expressed in, in, in this gain or loss of chromosomal material in, in the tumors. So from this analysis using the, the isolated nuclei, they were able to identify 
uh, that the, pre the, the tumor with, uh, which expresses the, 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 the estrogen receptor and they are less aggressive than the triple negative tumors, they are not as aneuploid as the triple negative tumors. And in this sense, they can be able to, to, to draw this kind of, of, of phylogenetical trees based on the number and type of, of, of genomic alterations at the DNA level, copy number variation, in order to analyze how this tumor is evolving. And they, they found that for at least for this kind of tumor, the number of alteration is, uh, is uh, somehow maintains through time. And then sometimes for reasons that we don't really yet understand, there is a burst in, in, in chromosomal alterations that will generate another clone which will be more uh, aneuploid. And this, will my, and this might generate more genetic uh, diversity in the tumor, which might be later related with the, with the development of, uh, of, uh, of a new tumor or a metastasis. Uh, of course, uh, it, was, it was a little bit difficult to, to combine both and the copy number and the, and, the, and the somatic point mutations in a single methodology. They resolved this through the, the, through the development of a new method called NUCSEC, uh, which is, uh, again, with a single nucleus sequencing, but uh, with enough depth of coverage that will allow a fairly good identification of, of point mutations together with copy number. So for this, uh, they used also another uh, uh, one, one estrogen receptor positive and one triple negative breast tumor to run this kind of analysis. And what they see, uh, what you see here is uh, one of the results. This is, this is the, the different cells that they sequence, the different nucleus, and uh, how they uh, divided the tumor, and how you can see also the presence of different uh, ploidy in these populations of cells and also the number of point mutations that you identify in different cancer-related genes. So they just replicated the analysis that, that, that they found in the positive in the ERP, ERP positive tumor. Uh, copy number is not as wild as in other type of tumors. And also the number of mutations that you can find in, this, in these cells is not that high. But when they analyzed the triple negative tumor, they found that uh, uh, an euploidy and, 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 and loss and gain of, of material, genetic material, is a more common uh, uh, situation that you find in the, in the triple negatives compared to the other tumors. And this might be driving the, the genetic heterogeneity that you can find in this kind of tumors. And also when you check the number of point mutations, it's, it's, it's higher in the triple negative tumors than comp comparing to the, to, the, to the other types of tumors. So this just corroborates the idea that triple negative breast tumors are very are highly um, their genetic they, they are very um, heterogeneous and they have a lot of genomic instability expressed both at the number at the copy number analysis level and at the point mutations level and this wouldn't be uh, possible to do without the application of single cell nucleus. So they came out with this model where you can see that in the estrogen receptor uh, tumor. And euploidy occurs very early during, the, during the, 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 the generation of the tumor. And then it's quite, uh, it, it, it's re it remains stable after clonal expansion. And then the point mutations, uh, they do uh, evolve gradually as we would expect in the, in the model that we discussed at the beginning of the talk. The accumulation of, of, of mutations is what results in the tumor. But uh, sometimes uh, this, is, this seems to be true, at least for breast cancer, regarding the point mutations. But sometimes an euploidy, when it happens, it happens at particular uh, uh, stages of the tumor, and it generates a higher number of clones, which later might be increasing the number of clonal populations in a single tumor. And if you can see in the triple negative breast tumor, an euploidy is more common. You will see different points in the, during tumor evolution when an euploidy happens. And since an euploidy can change even uh, the, the number of complete sets of chromosomes, this will have a profound impact in the genes that are expressed and in the number or, or, the, or the footprint of genomic information that is changing in every event of an euploidy. So uh, the combination of an euploidy changing uh, very large areas of the genome and the with the combination of point mutations is what the, at the end uh, generates uh, both the, the diversity in the tumor, the 
intratumoral heterogeneity, which will in turn, which will uh, 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 will be very related with the uh, with the development of uh, the clinical development of a particular lesion, and also how it will respond to treatment. And now for the single cell RNA seq, uh, some of the papers that uh, you can read uh, about this. Uh, some of the first uh, situations that were done in, in breast cancer was also were also focused on a primary team, triple negative breast tumors where they dissociate the cells to the cells and they 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 fax they, they use fax uh, in order to to sort them every single cell in 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 wells of a 96 well plate and then perform the single cell rna seq and as you know well the the the, mo the most important result that you get from this is that you will get a, a gene expression pattern for each of the of the of the populations of cells that were composing the tumor, and that you can uh, identify them. No, you will find the the expression uh, signature of the epithelial cells here in red, and you can compare them with the cells from the from the immune system. No, so this kind of efforts will allow you to really dissect the different type of clones that are composing a tumor not only regarding the type of cell in itself which is a which is a lymphocyte which is a, 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 a which is a, a, an epithelial cell which is a macrophage but also within a, 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 the same type of, of cell populations for example the, the epithelial cells composing the tumor you will see that there are different clusters of gene expression so within a single tumor within a single cell type you will find different clones of cells expressing different stuff. And this will be very related with the type of uh, uh, number of, of responses that you will have in order uh, when you treat this patient for, with a particular compound, for example. So this type of analysis is very, very interesting. It's still not used in the clinics, but I think it will play a very important role in the characterization of, uh, of tumors in order to understand how many uh, uh, different types of cells are present in a tumor, and particularly as we, as you remember from what I told you when you when you were trying to identify the expression of estrogen receptor, for example, this might be the cells that are positive for est for estrogen receptor, and these are negative for for estrogen receptor. So you will have a very a, a much better understanding or of, of, of the types of cells that are present in the tumor and which type of potentially. Um, important clinical targets for, for, for diagnosis or for treatment they might be expressing. And in that way, you will have a better uh, a tool to combine uh, different types of therapy for the particular patient. Uh, now, what we are trying to do here in Mexico, uh, uh, it, this is not related directly with the single cell genomics, but as, uh, as, as you heard in the, in, when uh, Enrique Cangli presented me, we have been working on the analysis of breast tumors from Mexican and Hispanic populations. As you might know, and I think that was one of the points of the last talk, um, if you analyze the, the, the data coming from uh, cancer genomics databases around the world, there is a lot of missing information regarding um, underrepresented uh, ethnical populations. And one of these is the Hispanic population. So taking this into account, the last 10 years, we've been working with our clinical uh, partners and collaborators in order to define which is this uh, genomic landscape of, of, of alterations in, in tumors, in breast tumors from Mexican and Latin American patients. You can check this, uh, this paper in Nature Communication. It came out a, a week ago. And uh, this is what we are trying to do, to, to combine different informations from the genomic uh, landscape in order to better understand uh, how it's going, what is going on, and how these tumors differ from Caucasian tumors. Now, so in this report, we obtained uh, sequencing data, both at the DNA level, somatic copy number aberration, and gene expression, you know, and compared this, uh, the, 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 what we found with other populations from other regions of the world. No? And this is also very important that the next step, the next logical step would be to uh, use uh, single cell genomics in order to better characterize these interactions. Actually, there is a, an interest uh, in, the, in the human cell atlas to incorporate uh, data from uh, underrepresented population at the single cell level. No? We don't really know if uh, these ethnical uh, uh, differences that we know are there might change the number of mutations or even cell composition of a particular um, organ. 
Uh, and this is something that we might be able to respond if we are able to work with single cell genomics and uh, contribute to this effort uh, with samples from uh, underrepresented populations. So with that, I would like to end my presentation. Thank you all for your attention and just tell you that which are our uh, perspectives here at the National Institute of Genomic Medicine for working with single cell analysis. Where we just acquired a 10x chromium system that which will be installed in our core labs in the next months. Uh, it will be initially set up for single cell RNA-seq. And of course, we are open for collaboration and hopefully we can establish some of these collaborations with you guys in the next future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alfredo, for this wonderful presentation. And, and it has given us a broad overview of how to use these ideas for the analysis based on, on several omics, but particular emphasis on single cell genomics for different uh, cancer uh, approaches, cancer related approaches. We have a number of questions, so let me go straight uh, onto them. Uh, from Sebastian Urquiza, very good talk. I have a query. In cancer, is it, it is well known that there is a chromosomal reorganization and at the same time, there are repetitions of some regions that are created. Could this create errors in determination of the existing cell populations in cancer? And are there other ways to correct these kinds of errors? Well, it is an, an interesting question. And actually in the, in the first papers that I presented, that's what they are dealing with. The appearance and, 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 and the characterization of copy number aberrations, which are common in cancer. And yes, they might even, they might represent the amplification or deletion of a particular gene or the amplification or deletion of whole chromosomes. Or in some cases, it's also common in some tumors to find, for example, polyploidy, the, 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 the whole uh, um, replication of, of the whole genome in a single nuclei. And you will find different, amount of the, different amounts of DNA in a particular nuclei. These are very aberrant cells that because of uh, alterations, for example, in programs like apoptosis, they are not able to die or, uh, and they keep reproducing and they just... Uh, uh, they perpetuate this, the, the, the transmission of this aberrant genome, which in turn will also impact the number of genes that are being expressed, uh, both uh, the ones that are deleted for obvious reasons, they are not there, and the ones that are amplified might be or not uh, uh, overexpressed. But uh, it will completely change the architecture of the nucleus, and this will have a profound impact in the expression levels that you will find. But at least what we have seen and, uh, and has been published, I don't think it's enough to, 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 to change the identity of a particular cell. So it, might, it, might, it will bring some noise into the expression data, but I think you will still be able to identify the, the expression of particular sets of genes that will allow you to know which are the, the, the cells of origin. Um, this might not be true for all tumors, for example, tumors which are in the germ cells, which are very differentiated, then they, they might have another, uh, another um, behavior, but a uh, copy number variation, at least at what we know, uh, will change profoundly the number of genes and the type of genes that are expressed, but not enough to change the, the, the identity of the cell that's itself. Dennis. Mute. Yeah. Okay. Do, do you think that uh, you can actually use a single cell to keep similar cells, even though they, they may have uh, copy number differences? I mean, the, the cell identity would be the same? Yeah, I think so. I mean, at least from uh, when you uh, copy number changes, even though they might be very important, I, I think they will have it. Based on gene, ex well, it depends. The question is if you can use copy number analysis to 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 put things together to to, to cluster cells in a particular lab. Yes, actually, uh, from from the first days of copy number variation analysis in cancer, it was uh, uh, we first learned that uh, different type of tumors share uh, common uh, copy number alterations. 
it might not be as good as expression, but it's, so it, it, it's, it's a good way to start. If you have DNA copy number aberrations for a particular tumor or cell type, you might find regions which are most commonly affected by, by this type of, of, uh, of alteration. So you might be using for, for um, uh, identifying these types of cells. Okay, thank you. We have a next question from Nicolás Gascuñán. Great talk. How do you think that a single cell analysis may help basic scientists and clinicians understand better subclonal selection effects on resistance to therapy and in metastatic colonization? This is, well, this is a very active and open area of research right now. Um, there are uh, one of the uh, accepted, accepted uh, hypotheses for uh, cancer for uh, resistance to treatment and, and also for metastasis formation is that uh, the, these, these characteristics might be already present in the very early stages of disease progression. So you might be able to identify metastatic uh, circuitry already playing a role in certain areas or in central clones of, uh, of very incipient tumors. And um, also, you might be able to find uh, small clones of populations which might not be uh, uh, susceptible to, to, to be killed with a particular treatment. And that's why it's very important to also support another project which is going on right now, which is the, the, the precancerous genome atlas, which is trying to characterize using this kind of methods uh, if you are able to find cells that are already prone to metastasis or prone to uh, the resistance to a particular treatment from the beginning of the tumor. Of course, if you let the tumor grow, <coughs> uh, and that's why it's very important to catch ca cancer very early, if you have a tumor which has already grown, uh, you will have a lot uh, of different potential clones. You are only increasing the number of potential populations, which might be, in a sense, be able to, to, to invade the, the tumor, the, the, the normal tissue, and form a metastasis, or you will have more genetic background to select for when you try, when you are using even combinations of different kinds of treatments. Just the, the, the statistical expectation that you will find the clone is higher in a, in a more advanced tumor than in a one that it's a, a little bit uh, uh, smaller, no? So that's why that's the way that we can use this kind of information, this kind of single cell analysis, not only for for detecting uh, uh, particular gene expression patterns that are related with both the risk of uh, of uh, metastasis in the case of breast cancer, for example, or which might be able to tell you which clones are uh, uh, will respond to a certain treatment. Uh, but also in understanding how this uh, phenomena of metastasis and, uh, and clonal evolution and selection through um, uh, treatment uh, are taking place in the tumor. And as we be better understand these this processes, we will have more tools to, to stop them. Okay, great answer. So re regarding this, this same, do you think that this pseudo time analysis may allow us to, let's say, reconstruct the, the path to, to metastasis or to resistance, or is it too early yet? I think it's quite early. I think, well, it's some of the papers that, uh, that came out uh, re reconstructing the, the, the history of uh, different type of tumors are based on this snapshot. It's just a snapshot of what you have in that tumor at that particular uh, time. And we also have to think about that you have a snapshot in time and you have a snapshot of the particular region of the tumor that was biopsy. So you don't really have a complete description of the whole tumoral mass, not in time and not in the volume of the tumor. So it's, quite, it's, it's been quite difficult to really understand how it is the, 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 the big story. For that, I think you will have to have, if you really want to, to, to construct or reconstruct the natural history of the disease, you have, will have to take uh, biopsies at different time of the, of, 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 uh, the disease. But it, it, of course, it's, it becomes difficult both from the ethical and from the clinical point of view. No? So it has been quite difficult to, 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 to get this kind of tissues. And uh, at least in the cases where this can be done, they tell us that uh, it might be useful because it somehow represents what we understand with the, with the snapshot. 
So it's a good way to start, but I don't think it will cover the whole story. And for okay. that, it, something very interesting is uh, I mentioned the liquid biopsy approach. And with single cell sequencing, you might be able, even without access to a direct biopsy of the solid tumor, wherever it is, you might be able to isolate uh, tumor, tumor circulation cells and uh, apply this kind of single cell analysis in order to reconstruct be a better reconstruction of the disease history. Okay, well, thank you. We have another question from Rafael Peixoto. Great presentation. Do you believe single cell analysis will become obsolete as spatial transcriptomic evolve? I'm not quite sure. I think, and actually I forgot to include my slide of spatial transcriptomics, but I, I think it's it, it's a very, it's, it's there, they give you different type of information. I mean, a spatial transcriptomics, it's easier. You don't really have to, to, to take care of the, the, the technical requirement, particularly of, of, of tissue collection and sampling. And um, it, I think it's easier. You just need a, a frozen tissue. Uh, but also the number of genes that at least right now you can analyze with a spatial transcriptomic is, is a little bit uh, limited. Uh, the, the great idea and the great benefit of spatial transcriptomics is that you will have a, a spatial correlation between what you see in a histological slide and the, and, the, and the genes that are expressed. But I think it will go evolving in, in, in parallel. For some other situations you will have to use uh, where you don't have access to, uh, I don't know whether, it, 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 sometimes it's easier to get the biopsy than the frozen tissue. It, it will depend on both technical and uh, the kind of question that you are asking, no? Of course, with the spatial transcriptomics, also the, the amount of tissue that you can analyze, at least right now, it's quite limited. It's a very small area of the tumor. And uh, that's, also, that's always the question when you talk about uh, intratumoral heterogeneity. It's the intratumoral heterogeneity that you can evaluate from a five micron <laughs> a slice of a tumor that was taken at a particular place of the tumor. And you are not really evaluating the whole tumor mass. So it will depend on what you're looking for. And the combination of, of a spatial transcriptomic with single cell genomics that might be might be offering a, a more comprehensive um, view of the tumor. I think we will find a middle point between them in order to get the information with it. Okay, we have actually two related questions to, to this very same issue. Luciana de Cesare says, excellent talk. Do you expect to see any training of pathologists in single cell analysis, specifically spatial transcriptomics, to discuss precisely tumor heterogeneity? Well, I think it, we will. I think we will. And uh, the example is that, uh, unfortunately, Latin America is not the best example for that, except for some, some of the countries. But uh, uh, more and more, you will see that pathologists will be, and, and of course, a lot of pathologists use right now molecular methods. And one example is the detection of the amplification of HER2 new RBB2 in breast cancer. Uh, Usually, pathologists were not uh, uh, trained to do a, a, a fish analysis, no, a fluorescence in situ hybridization analysis. But the evolution of the, both the diagnostic tools and the and the and the, and the treatments uh, will demand that uh, we all learn new tricks. And I think pathologists will, uh, and they have, they, they already have everything. They have. Uh, the, the, the skills for, for, for the tissue, for handling the tissue. And it's just a matter that they uh, go deeper into molecular biology in order to use, uh, at least uh, in this case, uh, spatial transcriptomics in order to, to, define, to better define the, the heterogeneity of a sample. Okay, thank you. And, and related, uh, Carla Vargas says, thanks for your presentation. Considering the highly heterogeneity on even normal cells that you talked about due to age and environment, what is the point on where we can consider a tissue or a cell to be normal? <laughs> well, with <laughs> genomics, the, the concept of normal <laughs> is something very difficult to grasp. And I don't think there's a normal uh, I mean, it will be very difficult to find a cell throughout our body, <coughs> which doesn't already have a kind of uh, potentially deleterious mutations, no? So we know now from the, 
uh, efforts in population genomics that uh, we, are, we are all carrying at least uh, three to four mutations in our cells, which are very related with Mendelian diseases and we don't have them. So we don't really know uh, where the normal begins. And actually I think the normal will be defined more than the genetic background, the functionality. In the, and the examples that I gave from the eyelid and the esophagus, that, that was the most striking point. They, they were completely normally functioning tissues, but they already contain, contain lots of deleterious of the deleterious mutations. So I think normal will be defined if the, <coughs> if the tissue is still working or not. <clears throat> okay, and at the other end of the spectrum, Elena Reyes asks, if we use single cell RNA-seq to further classify tumors, won't we end with, with up, with, won't we end up with a huge number of molecular subtypes that are hard to handle at the basic research and at the clinical research? I mean, if, if we keep further dividing, we may end up having 10 to the five cell types, one each, for each cell we actually measured. So where should we stop? And I think that's, a, that's an excellent question. And I think we still do not have enough data in order to, to define that, 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 that uh, uh, threshold. But I think, uh, and particularly in tumors, and that's, uh, that's very interesting in breast cancer, for example. No? As I mentioned, when you use single cell analysis, you will find that some of the clones are uh, uh, basal-like, some other are as the, um, the other type of the five different subtypes of breast tumors that we can find. And even some of the, of, the, of the epithelial cells that are from a particular expression subtype, you might begin to see clustering in different regions of your graph. No, we don't really understand really now what's, what's the meaning of that. But uh, some of these uh, uh, early experiments in single cell RNA seq analysis have identified different molecular signatures in the, in the stromal cells, for example, not only in the tumoral cells, but in the stroma, which are related with a higher uh, uh, risk of relapse. So I think it will come in both ways. As the, the more subtypes we, we, we define might be able to get us a very, a, a more the precise tumor classification for risk assessment or for treatment, but we'll also complicate things. So I don't really know how many, when you, and the, 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 that's why the relation of the, of the two questions is very important. I mean, every single normal cell is a different world and in cancer it, it will be the same. But uh, the idea would be to identify the, the most common themes that are shared in the tumor in order to attack the most common clones and at least have a clinical response in, the, in making the tumor uh, 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 smaller. Okay, so it will be more of a functional thing. I, I mean, more than different gene expression patterns of these different but very similar cells, if, they, if they're both like behaving similarly at the functional level, we must cluster them? Yeah, actually, I think so. And I think uh, the, the problem now and the question will be, how do you define function, functionality? Uh, but uh, the, the thing is that I think efforts like uh, the, the Achilles heel uh, of cancer projects that are trying to, um, even though the cells are expressing different stuff, there should be a, a common themes in cancer that might be exploited in order to, uh, to stop the disease. So I think that uh, we will have the information to better and, and to, uh, to better define different subgroups in, in cells. But the idea will also be to analyze this kind of data in order to find these common these commonalities in, in, in a particular tumor. And they might be not expressed in a particular mutation or a particular overexpression of a gene. Uh, and you know this better than me, you work with, uh, with, with networks. So the idea is to try to identify the, with these kind of mutations, which are the networks that are most commonly affected in a particular tumor, regardless of which genes are generating them and try to define uh, uh, definitions, uh, clinical definitions and clinical treatments based more on the, on the, on the whole network than like we are doing right now, particular genes which we are using for targets. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, Camilo Villaman asks, uh, well, says, excellent presentations. Since the Latin American population is very heterogeneous, do you believe that, and, and this, this may be a, a proposed your, your recent paper, do you believe that there is a need to develop country-specific clinical cancer diagnostic panels, or maybe a general Latin American population panel would be enough? This is important depending, because for example, if you are talking about hereditary cancer, BRCA1 and 2 are the most common example, uh, you will find particular sets of mutations that are most common in Latin American populations than in other populations. So in this regard, we have to do two things. One is, of course, increase the number and the options that we have for, for, for uh, genetic diagnostics in, 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 in Latin America. That's the only way we will have information in order to, to respond these que this questions. And second, you really have to be aware that the first step is to generate this data, what is the most, uh, which are the most common genetic alterations in a particular set of tumors of your interest. And then you will have to decide if you really need uh, 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 to, to, to develop a, a particular population panel from, lit, from least uh, and for most of the most common tumors. And we haven't really analyzed a lot of them in Latin America to answer this question. But at least for, for breast cancer, I think the, 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 mo the commercial panel, which covers the most commonly mutated tumors, will be good enough. But it's also, uh, you really have to, uh, to be aware that you have to generate the data in order to, to answer that question. Right now, it's, com it's very difficult to know if a particular set of tumors will have a particular set of mutations just because we are from Latin America. We cannot say that because we don't have the data. And as soon, as soon as we begin generating that kind of data, we will be able to answer that question. Okay, thank you. Uh, Victor Aliaga says, nice presentation. My question is, uh, that, that's more, more moving on to, to how to separate. Which markers do you consider to separate single cells from cancer sample to sequencing? That will depend on the, on, the, on, the, on the question that you have. For example, if you are interested in the particular set of uh, immunological populations uh, of cells, then you will have to use uh, markers for lymphocytes uh, in general, or particular for the different type of populations of lymphocytes in, uh, in infiltrating the tumor. Or if you want to separate just the epithelial uh, component of the tumor, then you will have to use uh, uh, an epithelial marker like EPCAM or something like that. But you really have to be careful because sometimes even these uh, tissue specific markers sometimes are lost in some tumors, no? So you really have to be aware what is the, the, the population that you would like to enrich to check before, if you can do it with immunohistochemistry that it is there, the marker. And then uh, after the disgregation of the tumor, use different type of uh, methodologies in order to enrich the population of cells that you are interested in. But of course you will have to check uh, the expression of the particular marker that you are using for, for the capture before uh, doing it, no? <clears throat> yes, thank you. And, and it's, of course, a complex, a complex issue, right? Uh, yeah. Renan Simoes says, congratulations on the great presentation. Do you think that with the evolution of the methods of transcriptomic analysis, we as researchers will have a limit of analytical capacity and will migrate to develop algorithms that cannot only handle massive data, but are also able to interpret and translate it like for human understandable answers. At some point, will we not be able to keep up with the amount of biological information? Well, that's a, it's, a, it's more into the future, but uh, I mean, we are here discussing single cell genomics when uh, 10 years ago, <clears throat> we, were, we, were, uh, we were not able to decide how many human genomes are necessary to understand a tumor, for example, no? So I think it's just a matter of, uh, I'm very uh, optimistic that we will be able to handle the data uh, if the world don't, doesn't end before because of, uh, uh, <laughs> of heating the, 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 the world because of using these big servers. But that's something we, we should take into account. Uh, but I think, uh, at least from a theoretical point of view, is something that can be managed. Um, 
and it will depend on the amount of information that you need. Now, I think, for example, that the use of uh, artificial intelligence or deep learning algorithms to mine this kind of data will also help us in selecting what kind and type of information will be the most useful. So I think it, you will not end up using everything that you sequence, but you will, we will be able to better select the type and, 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 uh, 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 of information that we need in order to set up those algorithms. And uh, I, I'm not exactly sure what uh, does it mean to, to generate an answer which is understandable for humans, but an example that I will give you, and it's very relevant, is uh, in the clinical practice. We have to develop algorithms and tools and reporting methods which are understandable for a clinician. Uh, for a clinician, it's not, uh, you cannot give a clinician a BCF with a list of thousands of mutations, so he can, he can select which ones uh, 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 will use for treatment of the patient. And we really have to be aware of that. Not only the clinicians, but also the basic sciences, the, the bioinformaticians, that it is important to make this information available for clinical making, for clinical decision making. And not, uh, you will understand that sometimes a, a, an oncologist uh, have more important things to do, like treating a patient, than reading a BCF file. Now, so I think it's it's a good way to start that we all move, that we all share uh, the idea uh, on how we make this information understandable, not only for the researcher but also for the clinician and at, and at the end the patient. No? <clears throat> Okay, well, thank you, Alfredo. We, we really enjoyed your talk, and, and, I key, and I'm sure that actually get a, a good roundup for this uh, first day of the, of the workshop, because uh, we go from the analysis to the experimental issues, to the ethical issues, and then to, to, the, to the actual biology. So I, I guess this will uh, round up a, a very uh, first day of the workshop. Thank you very much for your presentation and we really enjoyed your, your talk. Uh, we are moving on. Uh, Patricia will present some closing remarks for today's uh, meeting. So uh, let's let's listen to them, to her. So thank you again, Alfredo, for your great presentation. It was really uh, very, very good for the wrapping up of the first day. I would like to thank all of you for joining the day one of the uh, Human Cell Atlas Latin America Single Cell RNA Seq Data Analysis Workshop. Uh, all the speakers, Alfredo, thank you, and all the other speakers for all the wonderful talks and discussions that we had today. Our supporters, uh, Chen Zuckerman Initiative for the HCA meetings, and our local supporters that helped us make this happen. Thank you for everybody involved in the program committee uh, from Brazil, from Chile, from Mexico, and people from the HCA. Also uh, the scientific committee to which we added more people from these countries, including uh, Daniela, Carlos, and Hiki from HCA, David, and Inacio. Uh, people involved with different aspects of making this uh, ha making this meeting happen. So we call them HCA Latin America workshop staff from the HCA, Luke, Tracy, and Samantha, and our local uh, friends, Laura, Romario, Christopher, Ellen, and Elena, who are dealing with the webinar itself. Uh, the trainers for the second week from Brazil, Chile, and Mexico, all of you already got links for our meeting in half an hour together with everybody else who was selected for the second week. So please check your email. If you did not get this link, please uh, reach out because you're supposed to have already got it. And some upcoming HCA events, the HCA Bio Network Seminar featuring the heart and musculoskeletal networks, the HCA General Virtual Meeting, and the HCA Developmental and Pediatric Cell Atlas Virtual Meeting. And of course, we're gonna have uh, our meeting uh, made available on our YouTube channel. And join please the HCA project registry for uh, more information about the Human Cell Atlas activities. And uh, we will have a survey after this meeting. Uh, it will be sent to you by email at the end of the week. 
on uh, April 30th. I think that's it. Thank you very much for joining us today.